You're live. Good evening, everyone. We will call this meeting to order. I am the chair, Tiffany Baker, and at this time, we will call forth Commissioner Ivy Harris to lead us in the flag salute. Come on, beautiful. Hello. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Erica, would you call roll call for us, please? Yes, Chair Baker. Here. Commissioner Faulkner. Here. Commissioner Harris. Here. Vice Chair Huerta. Here. Commissioner Pastorian. Here. Commissioner Steed. Here. And Commissioner Wilson. Here. Thank you. Okay, we'll start off with presentations um, regarding the National and Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Randy, that's a mouthful. It is, it is. And um, I will say it is my absolute pleasure to bring you this brief presentation. Um, and not only um, as um, uh, uh, an employee of the city of Temecula and the executive director to this commission, but as a first generation uh, Indian American woman. Um, on Tuesday night, uh, the city council for the very first time went ahead and proclaimed um, May as uh, National Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, during this particular month, we recognize the history and achievements of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders across our nation and in our community. And the mayor, on behalf of the City Council of the City of Temecula, on Tuesday night, went ahead and proclaimed National Asian American and Native Hawaiian, Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month and called upon our community to learn more about the history of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and to observe this particular month with the appropriate programs and activities. And of course, through our community services, there are a ton of those, and folks can definitely find out about all of that information on our website. We actually had the privilege of hosting um, our MSJC partners on Tuesday night to receive the proclamation. So I want to go ahead and, um, and thank um, Carlos Tavares and faculty members, and Jeanette Oberg, Trukai Mai, Loda Cobb, and Marissa Jones, representing the MSJC Asian Alliance. Um, uh, and they did a series of API uh, related events to, to celebrate as well. Um, and uh, with that, we're gonna play a short little video um, and then we can go ahead and, and, and move on. Thank you, Madam Chair, for, um, for allowing us to do this brief presentation. So Jonathan, if we can roll the video. Hello, everybody. Ni hao. Hi, konnichiwa. Hello, daigaho. Hello, my name is Wen Shang Kuang. Ni holo ma, ngoi gamiang hai chi mo gay. Hi, I'm Kelly Busquets. I'm an engineer with the Goddard Space Flight Center. Mabu hai. My name is Tony Arviola, and I work at Langley Research Center. My name is Karthik Shade. I'm an astrophysicist working in the Science Mission Directorate. This is Kenji Miki. My name is Jenny Staggs. My name is Steve Shi. I'm the Associate Administrator for Diversity and Equal Opportunity here at NASA. Annyeonghaseyo. Currently, I'm rotating in as the Communications Lead for NASA's Human Research Program, but I am also a Flight Controller in Mission Control for the International Space Station. I'm a Research Materials Engineer. I'm a Program Analyst. I work as a Software Engineer. So I work in our Environmental Management Office and our Center Operations Director at Langley Research Center. I do research on electric propulsion. Electric propulsion is like that really futuristic looking stuff you see in sci-fi movies where the rocket shoots out blue flames. I came here from Japan a long time ago hoping that I could work for NASA. Actually, this is my favorite picture that I kept near my desk for a long time. 
I am a proud American. I am proud to be an Asian American. And I'm so proud to be a part of the NASA family. I'm second generation of Vietnamese and Taiwanese descent. I grew up in the Philippines. I'm Indian American. I'm Filipino. Both my parents are from the Philippines. I come from India. I continue to ensure my children do not lose touch with their heritage by teaching them the language as well as English. I am really honored and blessed to be part of an organization that embraces uh, diverse backgrounds. But never in my wildest dreams did I expect to be working at NASA. When I came to Johnson Space Center specifically and was able to find that community, um, it was so nice to kind of have that instant connection. Space is a very unforgiving environment and it often takes a very diverse team of people to be able to overcome space challenges. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to work in an agency where our work benefits the entire world. So no matter what your background is, I say to you, if you're interested in doing space, there will be a place for you to contribute. I am profoundly deaf, which makes me a unique person who is a deaf Asian employed at NASA. I had to overcome both language and hearing barriers. I'm an ambitious woman and I do not let anyone discourage me. Do you notice my speaking? I have some speaking problem on top of a Japanese accent, but in NASA, no one care about it. They just care what I'm doing. So it makes me very happy and proud of myself, 100%. Make sure that you chase passion and not chase success. If you chase passion, success will follow. Follow your passion and dream and always look to overcome obstacles rather than running away from these. Visit as many different places as you possibly can. Travel if you can as well. It helps build out perspectives, build out, build out your worldview. The theme for 2021 Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month is advancing leaders through purpose-driven service. Thank you for joining us in celebrating uh, Asian American Pacific Islander uh, Heritage Month. Happy AAPI Heritage Month. Dedani, kamsamida. All right, thank you. Paalam. Namaste, wanakam. Bye-bye. Joy again. Thank you. Madam Chair, one particular part of our proclamation that the mayor issued Tuesday night specifically states, whereas we celebrate, honor the invaluable contributions of the AANHPI community and that they have made to our nation, um, our nation's culture, the arts, law, science, technology, sports, and might I say, public service. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. At this time, I would like to um, call the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection to show us the presentation. So Madam Chair, we were just notified. Um, unfortunately, the fire chief um, had a professional um, fire emergency that he had to take off on, um, which is completely understandable. He has given us a thorough um, PowerPoint presentation that he was going to go through with you guys tonight, and it's actually in report format. Um, so we're going to go ahead and distribute that to you guys, and then we will either facilitate questions on that report, or we will just invite him back to the, at the next meeting. Um, but either way, that's where we're at with that. So uh, we get to go ahead and move on to uh, Chief Hall. Well, welcome, Chief Hall. All right, ma'am, am I ready to go? Yes, you are. All right. Well, I'm happy that my uh, competition isn't available to make it this evening. It'll uh, help us shine. <laughs> so uh, I threw up, this is our introductory slide. And this is kind of a, I'd rather be doing this in person, right? This is kind of a weird dynamic. Uh, we're gonna lose the back and forth a little bit. I understand my instructions are very clear to go through this presentation and then answer questions at the end, if you have any. Uh, so I'm going to try to give you a very high, uh, the 50 foot or 50,000 foot elevation overview of how the Sheriff's Department works, uh, and specifically here in the uh, Temecula area, and then hit some high points uh, that I was asked to cover prior to this meeting. Sitting to my left is my patrol operations manager, Lieutenant Mark Regali. Good evening. And so he will be able, he specializes in some areas I necessarily don't, 
and may be able to help me answer some questions if you have any. And he may tag in from time to time to cover something I miss. Uh, so the opening slide here uh, covers Sheriff Chad Bianco's ethos of service above self. And I'll move into the presentation from here. The Southwest Station covers uh, the Southwest area, which includes the city of Temecula. We have a city population of about 115,000 residents and covers about 30.17 square miles. Out of the Southwest Sheriff Station, where we're currently at, we also cover the unincorporated area, which services about 90,000 residents and covers 175 square miles. You can see the communities we serve listed there. Uh, we also service the Pechanga Indian Reservation. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of the employees that are assigned here at the station. As you can see, we have one captain, me, four lieutenants, 15 sergeants, that's our supervisory rank, Inve 10 investigators, seven corporals, 96 sworn deputy sheriffs, 19 community services officers. These are non-sworn support staff, two sheriff service officers, eight administrative staff, and four accounting staff. Next slide, please. Specific to the Temecula city contract, we have 169 funded positions. This contract, we provide contracted law enforcement service to the city of Temecula at the rate of 205 contracted service hours per day. That's the number of patrol hours we provide every day. It doesn't matter if people call in sick, if they're injured, uh, if they're on vacation, we still provide 205 hours of service a day. Uh, times 365 non-leap year days, that's 74,825 hours. <clears throat> About 17 patrol bodies a day. So 17 deputy sheriffs on a 24 hour period assigned to the city of Temecula. Now, I will cover a little later on how there's an enhancement to that in special teams, but that's your patrol deputies. Those are your men and women in black and white police cars responding to radio calls for service. The rate for that body, which includes the patrol car, the deputy sheriff, all the equipment, the support staff, everything I specified in the prior slide cost the city $197 per hour to man one deputy sheriff car. Next slide, please. Here's some additional, additional, I'm sorry, dedicated teams that are out in the city of Temecula and sometimes in the surrounding county area because criminals cases, they don't just stop at the city line they go on both sides. We have a very symbiotic relationship between the county area and the city area. County deputies help out city deputies. City deputies help out county deputies. But shown on your screen is a list of some of the additional resources that you have within the city of Temecula. And I'll go into a little more detail on those later on the slide or presentation. Next slide, please. Here's kind of a breakdown of the patrol operations we spoke about. 205 hours a day. It's broken into three shifts, a day shift, an afternoon shift, which we call swings, and the graveyard shift or the night shift. In 2019, we handled 68,898 calls for service. 2020, same time period, 81,378. In our unincorporated area, the station handled 18,988 calls for service in 19 and 20,352 in 2020. So you can see a significant amount of work is coming through this station. Uh, as the next slide, please, 
Uh, in this slide, I was asked to cover some in community engagement uh, issues. Uh, so what I wanted to highlight here is just how many people uh, service in our front lobby of the sheriff station here to do city business and or county business. Now, we strive to be a full service law enforcement agency to not only all the communities we serve, but also to the city of Temecula. So we do operate a full service lobby here at the sheriff station. The mall has a full service public facing lobby and so does the storefront down at city hall. Uh, at the station lobby, this is a breakdown of kind of uh, the business that was conducted there and how many walk-in customers, phone calls, things like that we had in April. Next slide, please. This covers the Promenade Mall storefront. And again, these are just walk-in customers or calls to a storefront in April. If I'm moving too fast, please let me know. Zach, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, is um, We have a little bit of feedback when you're speaking. Is the door to the room shut? We can try that. No, we'll try. We have some, um, the, the radio's going. Some of the stuff okay. we can only turn down so low. Lieutenant awesome. Rizal is trying to work on it now. It's in my ear as well. Awesome. Thank you. If you go to the next slide, it'll be the Old Town storefront, those stats. How's the feedback now? Is that better? Uh, it's hard to read the room. I, I see a couple people, then the cubes change. Yeah, it's, it's better, Zach, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so this is the last slide here on, on just kind of how our, our uh, public facing lobbies uh, engage the public. Next slide, please. And then I kind of, oh, that's good. All right, so uh, this is, we're often asked about hiring, how the hiring works. So what happens initially is we run recruiting uh, throughout the United States. Uh, and so we either find people to recruit or people find us using the website advertisements but no matter how we get a hold of these recruits, the first thing they have to pass is a written exam. Once they pass the written exam, they move into a physical agility test, push-ups, sit-ups, obstacle course, one and a half mile run, body drag. Uh, it changes from time to time a little bit. As a department, we're regulated by the California Peace Officer Standards of Training, which means there's there's some things we have control over. There's some things we don't. Uh, in hiring, post mandates what we can and can't do uh, in regards to recruitment or recruits or testing and evaluation. And they also mandate a lot of what we have to do in training. And a lot of what they mandate is a minimum. And we try to exceed the minimum, which I'll cover a little bit when we talk about academy hours. But after they do this written test and they pass this physical agility, they, they get into the main part of the hiring process, which is very complex uh, and complicated and very cumbersome for anybody that you know that's talked to that has applied to be a law enforcement officer. And that's the background packet. And this background packet is an analysis pretty much of their whole life up until the, fact, the point where they submitted this background packet to an investigator. And then this background investigator's job is to go through that, uh, verify that the information is correct, speak to people within their inner circle, their family, neighbors, check their credit, send them out for a, like a medical examination, a psychological examination that you can see some of the stuff is specified up there. And then ultimately go over all of this with a polygraph. Uh, this takes about four to six months for them to conduct uh, this background investigation. Uh, I can speak specifically to the background investigation as I was at a certain time in my career, a background investigator. And I can tell you that that process is very thorough. One of the major changes 
as a, when I was a background investigator is social media just kind of came on the scene and how much we do with social media in our background investigations. It was a lot then, and that was like MySpace time, right? When everybody was a friend with Tom. And now, uh, now we're in like Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, right? Many, many social media platforms that these background investigators have to comb through, right? And that difficulty is enhanced when the applicant doesn't tell us about one they may or may not have, right? So we have to source those out. So we spend a lot of time as background investigators uh, talking to their friends or friends of their friends. And a big part of the background is they ask us, we ask them to identify friends to send these surveys to. And then we usually use those surveys to go one friend level deeper to find out, you know, what this person's really about. Because if like on my resume, I'm probably only going to put the people who are going to say good things about me. Right. I'm not going to put the person who's going to give me a horrible review. And so those are the people we're ultimately trying to find is the person who's going to give us a, an honest evaluation of this person's character and whether or not they think they would be a good peace officer. Next slide, please. Okay, so once they make it through that background investigation, the medical exam, a psychological exam, the polygraph part portion, um, us completing a full background analysis, uh, they will be sent to the Sheriff's Basic Academy or what the California Peace Officer of Standards calls a regular basic course. Now, the state requires that in the regular basic course, which lasts about five months, that peace officers in the state of California be given 664 hours of training. This 664 hours of training covers 43 specific learning domains, which if you Google California Post, you can go right to the learning domains and look at them. They're all the way from force options and leadership to principle-oriented policing, to implicit bias training, to tactical communication, firearms, all of that. Those are all those learning domains, cultural diversity, discrimination training. Uh, we, the Sheriff's Department here in Riverside County, we train most of the agencies within Riverside County and many outside of Riverside County our basic training is 910 hours long. Once they graduate that 910 hour academy, there is some, a couple weeks of additional training they go through that's department specific. Because remember the basic academy for the most part is the standards, the curriculum is set by the state governing agency. So we have a supplemental academy where we do some department specific stuff we need them to know and then they get trained in whatever assignment they go to. So they could go to the courts, they could go to patrol operations, they could go to corrections, and they receive, depending on where they go, a certain amount of on-the-job training within those specified areas. For example, let's say they come straight out to patrol, which is pretty rare. A lot of deputy sheriffs go to uh, some assignment prior to coming to patrol, and it's usually within the jail system. Uh, that's unique to the sheriff's department because we run jails. Most police departments, the officer goes right out to patrol. Here, they may go do uh, a few years. Uh, I did a few years in the jail in Blythe uh, before I was assigned to patrol operations in Blythe. Uh, and so you have a on-the-job training program within corrections. At the time I went through, it was eight weeks long. I would assume now, since that was two and a half decades ago, it's a little longer now, uh, but a patrol on the job training program is at a minimum four months long, where they're paired up with four different training officers to go through four different phases of training, of on the job training before they're released to be a solo patrol deputy. Then most stations have an enhancement to that four months where they spend some time with say um, a domestic violence specialist, uh, a special enforcement team, uh, maybe with our uh, CBAT, which is our, where our deputies are paired up with mental health clinicians. They may spend some time uh, shadowing them to learn that specialty. 
Uh, they may spend some time with a school resource officer in the traffic bureau uh, before they head out uh, to be a solo patrol deputy. Then after that, we move into these required advanced deputy training classes. Now these are required every couple years, every three years, every year. Uh, this perishable skills training that involves firearms, driving, communication, force options, de-escalation, communication, self-defense, for example, is 40 hours of training required every two years. Uh, some are rank specific, some are mandated by the state, some are mandated by the department, some are mandated by the county. So it just depends, but we have a significant amount of continuing professional training and advanced officer or advanced deputy training that is mandated for deputies to go through either yearly, uh, biannually. It just depends on what the training is and who mandates it. Next slide, please. One more, please. Okay, so I was asked about more community engagement. Uh, I just want to throw up, uh, here is some community engagement items the Sheriff's Department engages in. We have a chaplain corps. We have a citizen's patrol. We have an explore program. We have a mounted enforcement detail that's uh, deputy sheriffs on horseback. We have a mounted posse that's volunteers on horseback. We run community neighborhood watch programs. Uh, now that uh, everything in the sheriff's department and government has an acronym, right? Everything, it's an alphabet soup of acronyms. So I, some of these I left in, and most of them I tried to spell out. That RMRU, that's the Riverside Mountain Rescue Unit, that's Desert Search and Rescue and Urban Search and Rescue. Uh, the sheriff's department maintains volunteers and sworn deputy sheriffs on all those teams. Uh, we have uh, dedicated domestic violence response teams. We have a dedicated homeless outreach team. We have our LGBT liaison unit. We have our dedicated Metro team. That's your team that's in Old Town. We run a uh, ride along program that's open to everybody in the public. Anybody that wants to come ride along on a patrol shift with a deputy sheriff is more than welcome to. We run uh, social media platforms. We are part of the Suez counties and the state's suicide prevention coalition, the county behavioral assessment team. We have a dedicated one of those in the city where that's where a deputy sheriff is paired up with a mental health technician, clinician, so that they can be uh, the first responder to somebody that's suffering uh, through a mental health crisis. Uh, we're kicking off a special needs registry. That's for families that have uh, children that say are autistic or have uh, mental health issues that they can pre-register that family member with the sheriff's department to that we can put into our CAD system for dispatch so that when we get dispatched to a call for service at their house, we get some initial information on the front end that says, this is who the child is or the adult. This is what their, um, their issues may be. This is what excites them. This is what calms them down. This is where they may be going when they elope. Uh, you know, so it gives us an edge on getting out there, getting to them faster and returning them to their families. Uh, so we do things like that. We have a tribal liaison unit that works with all the tribes located within Riverside County. And there'll be more on some of these specifically that I thought you would be interested in. The next slide, please. Uh, here's, so here's just, here's an example of something that the Sheriff's Department does to support community members. Uh, this was, we had obviously April was Autism Awareness Month. The Sheriff's Department, not only are we working on this special needs registry, promoting uh, it for success, uh, the sheriff authorized this shoulder patch. So we have a couple of these now. I expect us to have more where uh, we sell these, deputy sheriffs and patch collectors buy them. The money goes to charities or to fund research 
or you know whatever the specific cause is, and then deputies can wear them on their uniforms during that month. So just a way to help connect uh, with residents in our community, uh, you know, in, in whatever involves them in their lives. Next slide, please. Uh, we partner with the Safe Family Justice Center. I actually sit on the board of directors for that. That's a Temecula-based group out here off of Pujo. We also have a, an office here by uh, the station, but SAFE is committed to providing services for children, youth, and families who have experienced or are at risk with abuse or violence. They provide classes, they provide training, they provide victims assistance, they provide support, uh, police activity leagues. We do events, uh, children that have uh, suffered through some kind of trauma, uh, they bring them on board. They do things with them. They get them involved in sports. They help them. They provide education to their parents. Uh, a very good program. I encourage you to check it out uh, on the internet. Some very good stuff there. It often shows up on our social media. And uh, because I sit on the board, we're often pushing it through the sheriff's department's uh, social media as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the tribal, uh, our tribal engagement. And I'm gonna, this is where I'm gonna turn over to Lieutenant Regali because he specialized in this for many years. And this is, a, this is a very big component of what we do here in the Sheriff's Department. And then specifically out of this station because of Pachanga and other tribes. Uh, so uh, this unit was established back in 2008. Uh, what we realized at that time uh, following a series of uh, difficult events that uh, as a sheriff's department, uh, we had uh, very poor relationships with our tribal communities. In some cases, they were, they were very poor. In other cases, they were non-existent. Um, and so we created this unit. Uh, this is a non-uniform, non-enforcement unit. Uh, I was proud to be in this unit for four years. I did it two years as a sergeant. I was promoted to lieutenant, and I stayed an additional uh, two years as a lieutenant. Um, and so six of our patrol stations, six of our 10 patrol stations across the county uh, provide law enforcement services to Indian country. And this is a, uh, under a federal mandate, a law actually that was passed back in 1953 called Public Law 280 or Public Law 83280, which just mandates that we go into Indian country and enforce the state's criminal statutes, right? But um, here's the thing, the law doesn't allow us to enforce civil regulatory law, right? So provided that we can agree on what is criminal prohibitive conduct and what is civil regulatory conduct, you know, the relationship goes okay. It's when we can't necessarily agree with that or we don't have the relationships established to be able to sit and talk with some of our tribal partners. So uh, this unit was established in 2008, non-enforcement, non-uniform. Uh, my job uh, for the four years that I was in there was to build and maintain these relationships with all 12 tribes across the county to provide training uh, to our deputies specifically, because as I stated a second ago, six of our 10 patrol stations provide services to any country. So there's a very good likelihood that you are going to end up on an Indian reservation handling a call for service. As I used to tell the deputies that I was training at our academy, uh, when you arrive on an Indian reservation is not the time to determine that you don't know what you're doing, right? And many of the things, uh, many of the problems, and I'll just, I'll just be completely transparent. Uh, a lot of the problems we experienced in any country uh, was because of our own ignorance, uh, because we were ill-informed, because we didn't train enough, and we would go into Indian country not understanding tribal sovereignty, not understanding the limitations of, of Public Law 280 and what we could and, and shouldn't be doing there, um, and consequently uh, blowing up our relationships in the process, hurting feelings, damaging relationships, and it was very problematic for us. Um, I will tell you, uh, that we are in a much better position today with all of our tribes. Uh, never going to be perfect because we're talking about uh, sovereign entities and government to government relationships that don't always jive, right? Um, but, we, but we strive to be good partners now. Uh, we sit down at the table and we talk about things when we have problems or disagreements about what we should or should not be doing. Um, in addition to my patrol responsibilities here, I also serve as the liaison to the Pachanga tribe um, where I still maintain uh, close relationships with a number of people uh, that I worked with in my previous capacity. So, and uh, later on, uh, as we move through the presentation, I don't know if you have additional questions about 
what a county sheriff office is doing in any country, I would be happy to elaborate that on that a little bit more. Next slide, please. One more, please. Okay, so I, I will admit this is an area where uh, I'm not at the top of my game. Uh, and the reason is, is very few of our complaints uh, or surely our uh, major misconduct is handled within my building. Uh, we have a professional standards bureau, uh, often referred to as internal affairs, uh, that handles not only our criminal uh, complaints, but our civil complaints and our major misconduct. Uh, only is minor misconduct really handled at the station level. And that's like somebody doesn't handle a call for service appropriately, backs their car into something, is involved in a minor traffic collision. That kind of stuff is handled here at the station level. Uh, anything much more extreme than that is, is pushed off to our professional standards bureau and, and they handle it. So uh, I'll let you kind of read this, but basically we, we will capture a complaint uh, from a, a resident or a customer uh, in many forms. We'll take it over the phone. It can be, they can ask for a supervisor in the field. Uh, we can get an email complaint. Uh, it could go through professional standards bureau. Uh, we were mandated to give out complaint forms if requested. Uh, in the field, we call them yellows. We keep them everywhere. Uh, we hand them out. They can be filled out and returned to us. They can be mailed back in. And then each one of those complaints is, uh, is tracked. And uh, uh, um, there's, we have many, many processes for tracking these complaints and ensuring that they're adjudicated properly. Uh, our professional standards bureau tracks them. We track them in house. Uh, we now have a dedicated records management system to track just personnel complaints, uh, whether it be civil, uh, criminal, or uh, in misconduct. Um, if we do have a criminal issue in the station uh, perpetrated by one of our employees or the allegation that there is criminal, it will never be handled by somebody inside our own building. Uh, a, a detective from a, another station will handle it or an employee from another station will handle it. Another agency will handle it. Uh, the Professional Standards Bureau could handle it. The DA's office could handle it. We don't handle those things internally so we can remove uh, the idea that there may be some kind of a bias treatment for our employee, right? Because as the commander of the station, I would like to say that that kind of stuff never happens here. Uh, and the best way for somebody to say I covered something up was to say we did the investigation. Uh, so to ensure that kind of thing doesn't happen and we don't even have to ever try to justify it, it's always handled outside of the station. Did I miss anyone? You did, but I, but I will add, um, this is a very important process for, for our agency, right? And then no one likes to, to, to learn about uh, employees who are uh, under delivering service or who are providing poor services to our community or community members. Um, but this is a, a very important process that we take seriously at the management level here uh, because it allows us to, to identify our employees who are falling short of expectations, who uh, are in need of additional training, or to be quite honestly, sometimes uh, no longer deserve uh, to carry a, a badge or be part of this department. And uh, it serves no one's interest, uh, specifically the community um, and also our department, to turn a blind eye to people uh, within our organization who have challenges in doing this job the way that we expect them to do that. So this is a process that we take very seriously. All the complaints that come in are tracked, like the captain was saying. We follow up on all of them. We review them with a very uh, with great scrutiny, um, and uh, it is always our goal to make sure that um, we are holding our people accountable uh, for how they conduct themselves. When they leave here, right? Uh, when they drive out the back gate of this station and into the community, it is our desire for them to perform well. It is our desire that they treat people, all people with dignity and respect, that they know how to do their jobs appropriately. Um, but again, when that uh, sometimes falls short of expectations and that is a reality, uh, it is important for us 
to make sure that we're able to address that uh, in a timely manner, um, in fairness to the public and to the citizen who brings that to our attention, um, and also to the employee to try and help bring them back into compliance where we would like them to be operating. I'd like to point out that, and because I will probably forget somewhere in this presentation, that the sheriff's policies are all public facing on the website. So you can go to the sheriff's webpage and go to the transparency section. Not only are the policies there where you can read all our policies full and full length, uh, we also publish our misconduct reports. So if a deputy gets into some kind of misconduct and it meets some uh, legal threshold, uh, that report is published in its entirety on the web page for any resident to read. Uh, I will also tell you there's some bad information about out there about deputy sheriffs and body worn cameras and that they do not like wearing these body worn cameras. All of our deputy sheriffs wear body worn cameras and they love them because we do get a lot of complaints that turn out to be frivolous, right? Somebody is unhappy with the arrest, somebody's unhappy with the process, uh, believes that our deputy was rude or didn't conduct themselves appropriately. And in the past, all we've had was what the deputy said versus what uh, the resident said. And in some cases we would have a, a witness or two, maybe unbiased, maybe not. But the body worn camera has eliminated all of that. Uh, we are able to adjudicate many of our complaints almost right away when a resident complains and we say, hey, the deputy is wearing body worn camera, I'll watch the camera footage and I'll get back to you. Often they're like, you know what? Never mind. Uh, I don't need you to do anything here uh, because they know what the body worn camera footage is going to show, or we will invite them down here to watch the body worn camera footage with us. And, and sometimes they're like, well, that's, I guess that's not the way I saw it when I was there. Uh, and so we have really embraced the body worn cameras. The deputies have too. And it's really turned out to be a real benefit for us. Our policy, our internal policy is for all patrol personnel to have a body worn camera on them. And they are required um, to activate them when they're handling calls for service. Um, obviously there are times depending on the sensitivity of what is being discussed or what is being investigated that the cameras might be shut off uh, for privacy issues, uh, but any certainly any type of critical incident where uh, there is a high likelihood that we were going to in, be involved in some sort of use of force incident, they're mandated by policy uh, to have that camera on. Um, as a side note, uh, in addition to what the captain was just stating to you about um, the, the, the usefulness of body worn camera, what we have seen uh, not just here specific to Riverside County, right, but to our profession in general, is that the presence of body worn cameras tend to have a calming effect on both sides of the camera. And that's a good thing, right? Our employees now have learned, like, you need to be mindful of the things that you are saying and the words that are coming out of your mouth because they are being captured. We are going to be looking at it with a critical eye later on. And so what we have seen is that that's actually been beneficial on both sides. When they, when, when residents that were contacting realized they're being recorded, a calming uh, effect to that. And again, also deputies understanding everything that you're saying right now is being recorded and is, and is going to be listened to by your bosses and your boss's bosses. So uh, it is a good uh, calming effect for, for everybody, a very valuable tool. And, and we routinely uh, in regular audits of co like customer service audits, like you would expect any industry to do, we view these body worn camera footage just to make sure that what the what is what the deputy is conducting himself in a professional and appropriate manner. It matches what's in the report. It matches what's in the criminal filings, and you know, and everything jives. Uh, the other thing I will mention is there was somebody had made a question and asked uh, for me to address. Uh, the sheriff puts out critical incident videos showing. Uh, kind of a narrative along with the body worn camera footage. And they wanted us to do that in Temecula as well, but what we do, because at the end of the day, we are part of the sheriff's department. So if we have an incident that rises to the level uh, of that threshold where we're going to release uh, that body worn camera footage and he's going to recap it 
in one of the videos I'm sure most of you have seen. Uh, you can surely go to the website and find them. Uh, they will be done for the city of Temecula too, uh, just like they're done everywhere else. Uh, next slide, please. This is about reporting misconduct. These are all the ways that people can report misconduct. And I, I will tell you uh, that a majority of the internal investigations we do here are not uh, reported from an outside source. It's reported by uh, another deputy, it's reported by a supervisor, or it's caught in an audit. So the majority of the inquiries and internal investigations we do here are captured internally. They don't come from an external source like the public. Next slide, please. Uh, this pretty much covers uh, the administrative internal investigations. Uh, our shootings, uh, when we do have a deputy involved shooting, uh, that a team is assigned to conduct that. And that team is comprised of our agency, an outside agency that takes the lead and the district attorney's office. We here don't investigate our own shootings. And as of late, the sheriff's department doesn't take lead on our own shootings. An uh, outside agency takes lead. And as you may or may not know, uh, the Department of Justice now provides oversight on those shootings. So there's a Department of Justice review of our deputy involved shootings. Next slide, please. I was asked to talk about crime trends analysis and response times. So uh, I just wanted, I'm gonna throw out, this is just some of the things we do. I am a analysis guy. I like data. Uh, data drives our deployments. It drives our staffing. It drives our response. Uh, if we don't use data, we're just throwing people out there hoping for the best. He's not lying about that. He geeks out over this stuff all the time. I do. Uh, this is uh, something I really enjoy doing. I really enjoy analyzing this. And I believe uh, that the best results come from uh, data-driven analysis. Because on the back end, I can see a change in data, right? And by the change in data, I can reanalyze, redevelop, and redeploy and ultimately get those numbers to a place I wanted to be. So for an example, what you're seeing here on the board is a picture of something we produce every 24 hours from the day before. So when a deputy, deputies do their 24 hour shift, the next deputies coming off of their next 24 hour shift have a snapshot of everything that happened within the city of Temecula the 24 hours prior. And for them, it's a pseudo report card. Right? If you're assigned to one of those beats and you see that you have five or six catalytic converters cut off cars during the time you were on duty in that area and those catalytic converters got cut off, oh, well, you not only do you have to pay the price in briefing for everybody calling it to your attention, you get to know that everybody saw this, that you weren't out there doing what we expected you to do. Because if you were, those catalytic converters probably weren't taken. And this then gives like a burglary suppression team, investigators, they see this snapshot and they're like five cattle converters. Wait a minute, the night before six were taken from over here or the night before they were taken from over here. And these are designed to be layered on top of each other. And you can almost flip through them and see the crime trends. We have a crime analyst who watches all this stuff and tries to build the picture for us in case we miss it. But this keeps uh, deputies in their area, working their zone, because they want to come in the next day and see none of this in their area. And then when investigators or special teams come in the next day, they can pick this up and they can start linking it to the same suspect, the same modus operandi, the same location, the same good that's being stolen, or maybe the same suspect they caught with a bunch of catalytic converters, they can go back and link them to these crimes. So this is just one thing we do with the data we gather. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's another thing we do, and this is what are called part one crimes. And these are the main things that are tracked uh, that decide 
you know, how, when you see Temecula as the second safest city in California, the third safest, this is what it's based on. Now you'll see in some of the really bad crimes, these are very small numbers. So when you're like, hey, there's a 12% there's a increase or there's a 60% increase, well, maybe it went from five to eight. But in Temecula, we, we, don't, we don't have a lot of violent crime, right? But we do have a lot of property crime because we have a lot of like tourism and we have hotels and we have the Pachanga Casino and we have a lot of residents that are happy to call law enforcement. So in our area, like in some other areas, they wouldn't necessarily call the police if their bike was stolen. But here we encourage them to do so, right? Because I need that data point. I need that for analysis. That's gonna drive my deployments. And we'd like to see if you register the serial number and we'd like to put that into the automated property system. So later on, when the Metro team catches a guy or gal riding a bike, and they say their uncle Jimmy gave it to them, we can rot, run the serial number and find out that it was in fact stolen, it's not your bike, and get it back. So we use things like these charts come out every two weeks, and I use them to watch crime trends. And if I see too many of those red arrows, I start to really start to dig down, and deputies start getting redeployed, and shifts start changing, and set teams start working more weekend nights, or whatever the case may be, to ensure that I can bring those all to black triangles facing down. This is a station overview. Next slide is going to be Temecula City. Okay, and you can see the bottom half of this chart is our property crimes. The top half is uh, our assaults. Uh, while I am very concerned about property crime within the city of Temecula, uh, the violent crime surely drives my deployment models more than property crime, right? We will always work property crime, but I don't want to have to keep working uh, violent crime. Uh, violent crime in our city, uh, in Temecula City and the surrounding county area, very low. Next slide, please. This is a response time map. And I threw this up there just so you can see that I do watch this. I do track response times. Now, these are average response times. And there's something I want you to keep in mind here because depending on when, when you see response times, sometimes they're like, our, our response time to a priority one call, which is life-threatening, is two minutes. Well, my follow-up question would be to that, well, is that driving time? From the time the deputy or the officer got the call or is that the time from the the person called 911 in our response times it's always from the time the person called 911 so if you look at these response times this is from the time the person picked up the phone called the public safety answering point they figured out oh this is a law enforcement issue collected enough information to route it up to radio which is the dispatcher the dispatcher then has that in priority queue, decides, hey, this one has to go now. They push that information out over the radio. A deputy receives that information, drives from wherever they're at to wherever they're going, and that's where you get those numbers. So we watch this too, because if any of these numbers get too uh, out of whack, too far from another one, it's a deployment issue, right? It's a scheduling issue. It's a manpower issue. W what are our deputies doing if these get too far away from each other? And so this is another piece of data that we analyze constantly to ensure that my staffing models are true. Hey, Chief O, can you, can you break down these priority levels, one, two, three, and four? What, 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 is, what constitutes priority one, two, three, and four? Is that the, the, the uh, time it, to respond or is that a category of? No, he, okay. So I, Randy, am I good to continue with that? Do you want me to answer the question or move through yeah. and answer at the end? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, I actually, um, I think a lot of us have the same question. What is a priority one call? What okay. is a priority Pri two call? Priority one, immediate life threatening. Priority two, there's some level of violence there. And if we don't get there, uh, things could get worse, right? So you're like priority one is like your armed robbery, your bank robberies, shots fired. Uh, somebody's actively there with a weapon, active shooter at a school, 
things like that. Okay, here's another thing I want you to keep in mind on priority one. And th I could have this conversation all day long because it, unfortunately, there's a lot that goes into these. And I, I would say it depends a lot because like, say on a priority one and it's a bank robbery, right? Well, so that shows six minutes, but the deputies may have like met up at the corner, got a plan together, put a team together, brought in the helicopter, staged a canine, and then approached the bank. So, so the, the time is a little misleading. And some of these, the helicopter's there in a, in a split second, right? Sometimes on scene, but they are only getting, um, showing an arrival time when the first deputy gets there, or like in a domestic violence, which would be a priority two, the deputy is there by himself. So the deputy waits a couple doors down for another deputy to get there, or maybe it's a, a, a mental health call, right? So the deputy gets there, but they don't make contact because they're waiting for the mental health clinician to get there with the deputy sheriff to be the first responder on that call. So they're there, but they wait. So it's like, that's an average time, but it's almost better if I like had a specific incident where I could say, okay, in this case, let me explain to you how this went. So deputies were really there in a minute and a half or two minutes. And maybe uh, because of the amount of radio traffic that was going back and forth, the, the dispatcher wasn't able to capture that they were on scene. Like there's a lot of variables that may throw that number off, but, but priority one is that immediate life threatening. Priority two is some kind of violence, some kind of physical altercation, domestic violence, something that has the probability to become, you know, a, 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 a violent priority one. Like it could make it up there. Threes and fours, that's when you're moving into past crimes. I came home, uh, you know, my, my door was kicked open and my stuff's gone, but nobody's inside, right? Suspicious, suspicious search, a prowler, you know, a prowler is actually two. Uh, four shoplifters, you know, uh, a neighbor dispute, things like that, civil calls, child custody exchange, you know, things like that, that, that are more routine in nature. That's three and four, priority one and two are, are the more serious. Um, I'll also give you an example of something that really throws off our priority one and two response times. And I would literally have to mine through like thousands of calls. Like let's say on priority twos, uh, we had 48,000 of them, right? Uh, if a deputy goes out, say, on a shoplifting call, right, and say it takes them, you know, 40 minutes to get there because it's just a shoplifting call, the person's gone. And they get there and they're talking to the store owner and the store owner says, hey, you know, when he was leaving the store, I told him to stop and he pushed me. Well, now it's a robbery. So the deputy changes that call in the CAD system to a robbery. Well, that in turn changes the priority to a one. But, but it wasn't, it was a shoplifting, but the deputy turned it into a robbery, which now makes a 40 minute response time go into that average of the priority one, which throws it off. So I, if like to get an actual non-average, I would have to go through all 48,000 of those calls and establish all the outliers, right? And then mine through each one of those calls and knock them out. And I guarantee you there's hundreds if not more in there, where a deputy has gone out there and tried to, to adjust the call type to match what they were out with so that when it shows up on our tracking logs, it matches his or her report and it throws off the average response time. But something to keep in mind just from an operational standpoint, obviously the priority one and the priority two calls are just that. So it doesn't matter what the other deputies are doing. You could be working on something that's a three related or a four related. When that priority one call comes out, comes to us, right? And it's usually with a tone of something that catches everybody's attention. And the dispatcher says, hey, Temecula units, this is what we have going on. Our guys are trained and they understand at that point, it doesn't matter what else you're doing. You're stopping that and you're immediately refocusing your attention to this, right? And so some people will respond directly into the threat or the problem. Others might go to a point where we could anticipate that if the suspect is fleeing right now, we would expect them to take this direction of travel where we might be able to intercept them. So, uh, but the point being is that when those things come out, whatever else it is that you're doing at that particular time, even if you're out on a call and I'm talking to you, 
we say to the person, hey, I'm sorry, I need to leave and I will come back and we leave and we get in the car and we go to those problems. It's an all hands on deck kind of approach to making sure that we get as many resources to that problem and then scale back as needed, right? We'd either have too many people there, right, on the front end and then send people back or send people away than to have a single person, guy or gal, show up and not have enough people there to handle the problem uh, efficiently and bring it back under control to make sure everybody's safe. And it, priority one's for us, and, and I, I'd invite you all to come on a ride along, and I'd be happy to schedule that for you. There, in the priority one, it's uh, prefaced by a tone, and you the tone goes out, and you can hear silence, even in the station. Like, we'll, we'll be having a meeting, the tone will go out, and everybody will stop, because now everybody's okay, I'm getting ready to pivot to something else. Mm -hmm. And then it's whatever comes out, and then the ball starts rolling, and everybody, even the administrative team here, focuses on whatever that priority one response is before we go back to doing whatever we're doing. It is a showstopper for sure. I hope that did that answer the priority one, two, three, and four. All right. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, one, uh, go back, please, one. And this is, I was asked to talk about uh, diversity uh, within the department and resident diversity, right? Does, does the department build match with our community we serve? And of course we strive to do that. Uh, I had a slide in here, but I took it out. And I'm gonna tell you why. And I have it here because I printed it. Is I, have, I, I don't like putting something up that I can't prove or source myself, right? And so I had to rely on a county database to get the resident diversity. And to me, it seemed a little wonky because one, I didn't collect or verify the information. And it shows like population by race. And it says white, black, African-American, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, some other race, or two plus races. And so just on the surface looking at this, I realized that like a Latino Hispanic was left out. And so I started making phone calls and based on what we could figure out that the Latino Hispanic population was blended into the white for static, which made it, it kind of didn't match up with what I was going to report on department demographics. And then I thought if I put this up there, I think it's going to generate a lot more questions than answers. But so I will tell you, here's our department breakdown, and it closely mirrors our residential breakdown, except for the white, Latino, Hispanic part, which I can't, I can't figure out because I don't have that data point. Uh, so 56.61% uh, of Riverside County population based on the county website data is white. And I have to assume that some of that 1.4 million in there is where they're counting the Latino Hispanic population. And then some portion of the some other race, which I don't know what that is. And then the category of two plus races. And in those two categories, it's about 800,000 people. So in that like 2 million-ish, I have to assume that that's where they're putting in the white, Latino, Hispanic numbers because they're not listed anywhere else. So from a department perspective, we're 48% white. I'm sorry, 46% white, 43% Hispanic, which, which does align with these county numbers. Uh, a black African American to the county, 6.55% of the population in the department, the sheriff's department, 6%. Very close. Uh, we have uh, Asian in here by the county, 6% uh, uh, in the department, 3%. Uh, but we also have uh, in, in Asian, uh, Filipino, uh, and then in uh, Native American, it's 3%, 1%, 0.1%. And then we also have another category that is 0.5. Uh, and so those numbers closely 
match uh, the county's numbers. So I hope, I hope that answered that, that portion. Uh, next slide, please. One more, please. Sorry about the page marks. Those were for me. Okay, so these are, I was asked to cover some topics, some we already did, but I wanted to make sure I went over it again and hopefully answered some of your questions before you had to ask them. Uh, Body-worn cameras. Uh, for quite some time now, a year, maybe more, I know I was wearing a personally owned body-worn camera circa 2009. Uh, so since then, deputies have been wearing uh, video recording devices. Uh, I've been carrying an audio recording device and I know oh, I was trained to carry one since 1998. But uh, in the last two years, uh, we surely have been wearing body-worn cameras, the ones that are clipped right here, uh, and all of our deputy sheriffs have wear them and are mandated to run them uh, for public contacts and surely all critical incidents. And uh, by policy are subject to discipline, internal department discipline for not having them on. It's no longer okay to just say, oh, well, I forgot to turn it on. Well, that doesn't cut it anymore. If you forgot to turn it on, then maybe you'll remember next time after you receive your discipline. Right. The the we because what we were getting was well there was a learning curve right it was one more thing you had to turn on uh, and current technology it's kind of wonky because current technology doesn't allow this HD device that does sound and audio to run continuously for a twelve hour shift we we work longer than the current technology allows so there's a turn on turn off system that has to occur right now. And so in this learning curve, there was the, hey, I forgot to turn it on, right? Or, or the battery died. Well, that's no longer acceptable anymore. Uh, you will remember to turn it on and you will remember to ensure the battery is fully charged. Uh, and so, and we are disciplining in every action that that does not occur. Uh, and that direction has come down from the sheriff that those body worn cameras will be utilized. Uh, public release use of force videos, like I was telling you, uh, they, there was some request that they be done in Temecula. Well, of course they will be, uh, we just haven't had one, which is good news. Uh, CBAT, we have a dedicated, uh, the behavioral health assessment team. That's where a deputy sheriff is paired up with a uh, clinical, um, a clinician, sorry, this get now I'm a clinician, a mental health clinician in the car with the deputy sheriff to be the first responder to these incidents where people are suffering through a mental health crisis or emergency, or to be called in for a resource to somebody <clears throat> that needs some kind of assistance <clears throat> that goes above what a deputy sheriff would necessarily specialize in. We also, because we do not provide 24 seven coverage with these clinicians yet, we're trying. Uh, hiring these clinicians is difficult. Um, as you can imagine, most of the people that want to be a mental health clinician, uh, when they show up here because they got the job and we hand them body armor and we tell them they're gonna be working night shift with a deputy sheriff as a first responder, some of them are like, whoa, wait a minute. I, I signed up to work in the office during the day when things aren't so volatile. So finding that mental health clinician that is excited and interested to be a first responder in a car with a deputy sheriff has proved uh, problematic to some degree uh, because of that. And we here in the Sheriff's Department want as frequent coverage as possible. We entered into an MOU uh, with the city of Marietta where they have a CBAT team as well. Ours work opposite uh, ends of the week. And so when ours isn't on, theirs is, and we know to, we will use theirs when ours is available and they can use ours when ours isn't available to ensure that resources is available as often as possible to the most people that need it. Uh, you will, uh, there was something in this, uh, they, 
the chokehold, right? They they wanted police to ban the chokehold. Uh, many of us have heard that. There's been discussion about. We never had a chokehold. We never used a chokehold. It's surely not as long as I've been uh, in two and a half decades. Uh, I was a force expert for the department for many years. I was a defensive tactics and force trainer. I supervised the force unit. We never trained or utilized the chokehold. We here in the sheriff's department used what was called a carotid restraint. And that was uh, for shutting off blood flow, not oxygen to the brain. Somebody would lose consciousness, you'd handcuff them, take them to jail. Uh, unfortunately, in that misunderstanding, uh, we lost the ability uh, to use a carotid restraint hold. It was, as my understanding, banned in the state and uh, we removed it from our force options. Uh, I can sit and debate, uh, you know, talk about why, uh, why that was a bad idea, that the carotid restraint, and I'm not talking about a chokehold there, I'm talking about a carotid restraint hold was a very valuable tool to our deputy sheriffs that became engaged in a ground fight with a suspect that usually in those ground fights, uh, the suspect is trying to disarm the deputy sheriff uh, and in, in many cases hurt them with one of their own weapon systems. Uh, the carotid restraint hold was a very useful tool uh, to end that uh, without anybody getting seriously hurt. Uh, but either way, that tool is no longer available to us and we have stopped using it within the sheriff's department. Again, I wanna make it very clear. It was not a chokehold. We never had a chokehold. Uh, we have a, a very strong social media presence, not only uh, here at the Southwest Station, but the sheriff's department as a whole. Uh, we are running at an extreme level of heightened transparency even before uh, any of these changes were requested within the law enforcement industry and our community. Uh, we have posted those misconduct reports that you can read on the sheriff's page. Uh, he does the critical incident videos. Uh, we release body-worn camera footage, that kind of stuff. Uh, the special needs registry, that's where I was talking about an enhanced uh, procedure for us reuniting uh, people with their families that have some type of special need. Uh, that's gonna be very well received. Uh, deputy misconduct investigations, I talked about that. Our public facing policy manual, you can get right on the internet and download any policy you want, read it, uh, and then you know hold us to it uh, when we come out to your house to help you out with something. Uh, so there, I was asked a question about citizen oversight. Uh, well, uh, all our customers, all our residents provide citizen oversight for us, obviously through the complaint process, being able to reach out to the city, call me direct, calling one of my lieutenants. We are a customer service organization and we strive to provide good quality customer service. The sheriff is in the planning stages now of creating a citizen oversight board. Uh, I don't know exactly where they're at with that process. That's uh, way above my level, but I do know uh, that they are in discussions for something like that. And I don't know if it's going to be one citizen oversight committee uh, or board that will work directly with his office, or if each commander uh, will be tasked with building a citizen oversight community in their own jurisdiction. But when I know, I will let you know. And that concludes my presentation. Well, thank you, Chief Paul. Um, commissioners, I will turn it over to you for any questions or feedback you would like to share. Um, Amelda. Thank you, Chair Baker. And thank you uh, both for your presentation. I think this is National Police Week, right? Uh, this is uh, Memorial uh, Week. Oh, okay, I thought it was police week, but thank you for your presentation. Um, I just I did have a couple questions. You said you no longer have um, you no longer do and correct me if I'm wrong, but corroded restraint and hold. So is there something that you now do in place of that? Well, no, it's the carotid restraint, right? And it was the carotid arteries. 
And if you, you pinch those off a little bit, people lose consciousness for a few seconds and we no longer do that. There, nothing replaced that. It was just removed as an option while you were in some kind of struggle. Okay, and then um, my other question is, um, I had asked questions about a question about the PD dash cams. I know you have the body, um, the body worn cameras, and I know some agencies. I've heard mixed reviews about the PD uh, the dash cams. So I didn't know um, what the sheriff's department thought was on that, and if that's something that will be implemented. I don't. I don't know. I my prior assignment to being here is I was assigned to our sheriff's headquarters. And it was in discussion on putting in a front facing camera and a rear facing camera. Uh, however, the problem with those is most of this activity we engage in doesn't really happen in front of the car or behind the car. And there's a very limited scope, uh, you know, scope of, of, of vision on those cameras, right? Uh, and if you take a deputy sheriff, right, who's sitting in the car, you can now see what the deputy sheriff is sometimes seeing from the front of the car. But certainly when they exit the car, you're now getting that perspective as they engage the resident, which is far superior uh, to surely a forward facing dash cam. It, it, it's much better to catch video. It's much better to catch the audio. And we are currently um, t and &E, uh, a bunch of new cameras, right? Cameras that last longer are better video, better audio, uh, will run continuously the entire shift. Uh, maybe have a different placement to give a little bit better perspective on the video they cover. Uh, I can't tell you for certain, the Sheriff's Department is not looking at um, cameras and cars. I just, I can tell you personally, I, I think you'd back it up, that a body worn camera, it, the value is significantly higher, right? Because so much of the job is conducted away from the car, uh, in somebody's house, uh, in their yard, uh, you know, in an office building, a school, you know, uh, anywhere but in front of the car. The, da the dash cam was really like the first generation of when we were introducing video and trying to capture what officers or deputies were doing in the field, right? And to the captain's point, the very limited field of vision, right? So with the advent and the introduction and the use of the body more camera, we're still getting that, right? Because the officer gets out of his vehicle, the deputy gets out of his vehicle and approaches the car with the body more camera attached to him or her. Um, and so, uh, just from a technology standpoint, the, the body-worn camera actually attached to the deputy uh, is a better way, a more modern way to uh, capture what exactly it is that they're doing when they're interacting with members of the public, be it in a traffic stop. Um, we go back into the old generations, you would see scenarios where the cameras, the, the dash cams, and maybe the officer or the deputy brings somebody back to the car and they end up in a tussle or something, but it's off to the side and while you can hear audio, you can't see anything because the camera is trained to the front. So again, to the captain's point, uh, I don't know that the department has said definitively like, hey, we're not gonna do this or we will do this. Uh, but I think what we've determined is that certainly a body more camera is a much more superior product for being able to illuminate what exactly was occurring when our, our personnel are interacting with members of the public. That, that being said, as technology becomes increasingly cheaper, it wouldn't surprise me, right? Uh, when, when we first got the car cameras, it was like a VHS camera up there. And the reason it was in the car was because it had to be hooked up to the power system of the car and it recorded on like a CD. You know, now we're talking about very small cameras. So it would not surprise me is at some point if these uh, police cars come outfitted just with cameras as, as a build for them. I, I just don't know for sure. No, I appreciate the information. Um, I know that's been a topic in various police departments. Um, so I just didn't know where the sheriff's department stood with that. And then, um, and then I know um, you showed the response times um, data. Does that include false alarms or is that a separate 
uh, data set all together. No, it's all in there. Uh, it's all a majority of those false alarms would fall under priority two calls. Okay. Those are your commercial burglary, commercial robbery, residential burglary, residential robbery alarms. Okay. And then, um, okay. And then I know, um, I know you had other stats for various crimes. So in regards to, um, I, I've heard from like various um, individuals in the past and currently sometimes they don't report certain hate crimes. So I don't know how um, the sheriff, what is your, just a message to the residents if something does occur um, to contact you and just so you can start tracking that. I mean, I'm sure you are tracking some of them but then there's some incidents that maybe somebody at school is not reporting or somebody's getting bullied. I don't know how, what is your um, advice to the residents? Well, that, that, is, that is the problem, right? It's a, a data in, data out kind of system. Uh, I, I, every community meeting I go to, anytime I'm given an opportunity to speak to anybody and ask, is there anything we can do? Well, yeah, you, you report. You're, even if you don't think there's value to that, it fills in a piece of the puzzle for us, right? I want it on my map. If there is a hate crime, we have a very, very robust uh, policy-driven response to hate crimes or, or alleged hate crimes, right? Like it may not legally fit the criteria of a hate crime, but it doesn't mean that it didn't make you feel like it was a hate crime and we're not going to address it as a hate crime, right? Because there's a there's a pretty you know narrow legal definition for hate crime, but but the way it makes somebody feel triggers that same response from us, right? Where there's there's a, a deputy level in, uh, investigation, there's gonna be a detective level response, there's gonna be a supervision level uh, response, there's gonna be a management oversight in that, there's going to be uh, you know, maybe outside agencies in like a victim's assistance that are gonna get involved. Uh, we, are, we take hate crimes in Riverside very serious and for certain something we want to track right uh, we find that a certain type of crime is perpetrated by the same people most of the time right and only through data analysis and crime trends sometimes can we figure out who and where these people are and then prosecute them so piggyback on that uh, one of the things that i would say to anybody in the community is we depend on you. You are your, our eyes and our ears in the community. We cannot be everywhere and we can't know everything, right? And so I tell people, don't try and guess. And if something doesn't look right, something doesn't feel right, if you have concerns, you need to pick up the phone and call us. That's what we're here for. That's what you pay us to do. Let us come out and dig into it and we'll figure it out one way or the other, right? And to the captain's point, maybe it doesn't rise to the level of the legal, the strict legal definition of a hate crime but maybe there are things that we can do to assist that person who's calling to address these problems, right? The end goal is to make our community a, a, a livable place and so that everybody feels safe, right? So this is the external message. You as community members are our eyes and ears and we depend on you, right? And we will be responsive when you call us. If that's our job. We will make sure that we are responsive in a positive way. Internally, I can tell you, um, again, uh, overseeing patrol operations with the rash of crimes that we've seen uh, assaults specific to the Asian American community. Uh, I drafted a very comprehensive uh, email to all of my patrol sergeants and put it out to them proactively to say to them, hey, be watching for this, right? Listening to these calls, redo the calls, evaluate them and determine whether or not we are capturing what this event really is, right? It may only come as a squabble in a parking lot where two people you know, kind of box each other, but we may get out there and find out like, no, this is actually a hate related crime, right? So uh, we see that trend going on right now. So externally, we ask the members of the community to communicate with us openly and often. Internally, it's our job to kind of watch some of these trends that are going on and making sure that our supervisors and deputies in the field alike are watching for those things and then bring that to our attention so that we can address it appropriately. And I'll tell you, uh, if you look at, as I see it, my job, right? My fundamental duty here is two things. 
And this is going, this isn't like all the stuff I actually do during the day. But if you go to the very top, when I approach my job here, it's to ensure our residents real safety and their perception of safety, right? Because uh, I know that you are actually safe. Like I see the crime stats. I know what goes on in this town. This is a very safe community. And, and we're very proud of that, as you should all be. However, that doesn't really mean anything if you don't feel safe, right? And so my job is to not only ensure that you feel safe, but you are safe. And that's, that's community education. That's things like that. That's going out and talking to residents, uh, putting community related programs out there, some of our social media stuff. Uh, part of our job is to ensure that the residents also know how safe they actually are so that you can feel safe. It would make me feel terrible if I thought somebody was sitting in their home worried that they weren't safe in their house. Like that's a big concern for me. So we strive to ensure not only your res the residents real safety, but the perception of their safety as well. For just everyday life, visiting a grocery store, going to church, going to mosque, being able to move through your community as a, as a member of this community and feeling safe to be able to do that without being you know, harassed or bothered or feel like um, they're being targeted. Uh, that is our responsibility. This is our commitment to the community. It's absolutely fundamental to what we do. Well, yeah, and, and take that even further. You're absolutely right. It, and it's not like resident on resident, right? We don't want that. And we surely don't want anybody fearing the police, right? That goes into that, that perception of safety. We want people to feel and be safe here, to feel safe. Yes, thank you so much for that information. I, I hope that that, um, that is helpful for our residents as well. So thank you again for the presentation and your, um, and your service to the community. And for the clarification on Memorial Week, we definitely want to honor our uh, fallen law enforcement. So really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Harris. I have to remember to unmute myself. I first want to um, thank you both for the presentation. You were extremely, extremely thorough. As you were giving your presentation, I would come up with questions and then give it a slide or two and it was answered. So, <laughs> so again, thank you so much for being so thorough and also thank you so much for your service to our community. Um, you both, I know, put your lives on the line for everyone in this community. And it, it means personally a lot for me and my family and I know for the rest of the community. Um, so I just wanna begin, I have a couple of questions. Um, just, just bear with me a, <laughs> a little bit. Um, I'm not an expert at policing, but I would love to learn and understand and um, get uh, some of, or both of your perspectives. Um, so I'm gonna begin with the police uh, misconducts reports. You had mentioned that they are open for public record. People have access to them, um, albeit if they hit a certain legal threshold. Could you tell me exactly what that legal threshold is? You know, I don't know so, exactly. You so any, any, any allegations of misconduct dealing with uh, dishonesty? right? Things that actually tear at the fabric of our very credibility to be able to do our job. So an employee is caught lying on a report, uh, has done something where he received discipline um, and, the, and, and it is an issue of honesty or dishonesty. Uh, we are required now to make those, uh, to the captain's point earlier, uh, all of the records related to that particular uh, investigation and the discipline available for public consumption. It also talks about uh, allegations of excessive force. Any department member who has been accused of uh, applying uh, excessive force while arresting uh, a subject or whatever the circumstances may be in their official capacity as a deputy sheriff. And, and a robust and thorough investigation determines that that in fact is true, that the deputy uh, exercised too much force or excessive use of force, and those are also uh, available for public consumption. And then I think there's one other category 
Okay, you ready for them? Uh, yes. Okay, it's uh, <laughs> they to be released, right? Um, sexual assaults involving a member of the public, uh, incidents involving discharge of a firearm, incidents where the use of force result in death or great bodily injury, uh, incidents relating to dishonesty, prosecution of a crime, relating to misconduct, perjury, false statements, filing a false report, police report, destruction of evidence, falsifying or concealing evidence. Oh, that list. And it's on, if you go to the sheriff's transparency page where all these are listed, there it's broken down by category on, these are all the things that we release. There actually links there to each one of the cases and you can actually just hover it, click on it and the investigation in its entirety will open up to you to include the letter from the sheriff, whoever the sheriff was at this time, you know, uh, previous administration or current administration uh, stating that, hey, you have been found that you have been in violation of department policy and that you're going to be disciplined for that. Okay, or thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I briefly looked at the transparency page, but I definitely will go back um, and take a look at that. Um, I had a question about the corroded chokehold or the corroded restraint. What is the difference between that and a chokehold, like logistically? And is the corroded um, uh, non-lethal? Yes, the carotid restraint is a non-lethal pressure point control hold. The carotid uses this soft part of the arm here in two spots to pinch the carotid arteries off, which causes you to faint. Basically, as soon as the pressure is let off, the person wakes back up. A choke mm. is this hard part of the arm collapsing the airway, which causes you to lose oxygen and then pass out. With there's a lot, there could be damage to the airway. You know, there's a lot of complications with the chokehold, which is why we've never used it. Plus, it doesn't work well. Uh, you, many martial arts uh, have, did the chokehold was replaced in all like martial arts wrestling uh, with the carotid uh, restraint because the carotid restraint is non-lethal. It is very temporary and causes no lasting damage. Uh, having your trachea or your throat compressed is not good. And that's the chokehold and why we have never used it. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't know of any law enforcement agencies in my time on in California, I think that use the chokehold. It's always been carotid restraint. Okay. And the restraint too, just so you know, I mean, we try and train our personnel, right, to be able to resolve, I mean, be able to resolve, bring somebody into custody without having to use that. That is not like a, an immediate go-to situation where somebody is now struggling with us, or refer to it as, say, a passive resistant, right? They're not actually trying to, to assault us, but they're also not going with the program. They have decided, hey, I'm going to resist this. I don't want you to pull my arms back. I'm actively resisting you trying to take me into custody, but we try and utilize other techniques that don't involve immediately going to something like the carotid restraint because of the potential that just very moving while you're moving around and sliding around, it's easy to damage the front, right? The front trachea, right? And so we try and use other techniques, other applications of force, right? Uh, to, to avoid that. And I think the captain had mentioned earlier, usually where we see that happening is when somebody who is versed in ground fighting, right? Which we have a lot of people today who are, mm -hmm. uh, who spin quickly, grab a hold of the deputy and immediately drag them to the ground. And now to be quite honest with you, now you're in a fight for your life because you have somebody who's on top of you um, and they're trying to put you in some sort of a hold. And, and now you are really in a fight for your life. And this is generally where we see uh, their carotid restraint that would come into play in a scenario like, like that, because now you're just trying to hold on until you can get somebody there to help you, right? Where this might come into play, but it is not an automatic default like, Hey, I'm struggling with this guy. So now I'm going to immediately go to, mm -hmm. to the restraint and, and use this. Sometimes the tech, the technique very simply is to create di a distance and space, push the subject away from you, back up, transition to a baton, 
transition to tasers. Most law enforcement agencies today carry tasers, but create some distance, right? And allow to see what's gonna happen now. Give verbal commands, see if we can gain compliance, wait till there's another car there to help you, try and manage that to the best that you can. Um, but again, the point being is that we don't automatically default to, to that carotid restraint um, for all those reasons that I just stated. We are, even when it was authorized, uh, we rarely yeah. saw the carotid used. And like he said, when we did see it, it was a pretty bad situation. I worked patrol for patrol or, or detectives for the first 24 years of my career. I don't know that I ever, I can't ever remember a time that I applied a uh, carotid restraint on anyone. I, I was not comfortable on the ground. So if I needed to, I created distance, space and time to be able to transition to something else. And, and I can tell you in my my 20 something years, uh, I, like I said, I was a defensive instruct, defensive tactics instructor. I was a ground fighting instructor. I spent many of my years training uh, recruits and advanced officer training at the academy. I have never applied the carotid restraint to anybody in the field. Rev, thank you. Thank you so much for explaining that to me. I also wanted to highlight um, the Sheriff Department's excellent work, as I've seen and have you, as you've displayed with your community engagement programs. It looks like you have um, LGBTQ. You had mentioned um, that they are able to um, speak with you and um, uh, make recommendations. Um, I also love, I, I loved the autism patch. Absolutely love it with my nephew. Uh, he has autism and it means a lot to see um, y'all supporting um, the special needs community as well as um, your new response measure where people can input um, input the information of any family member and individual that they live with who um, need a special type of response. That's extremely important. Um, but my next question is regarding um, a community engagement group or program that is specific towards race and equity. Is there anything in, in the talks right now at the Sheriff Department about building relationships with communities of color? Well, I, I, I would assume there are those talks going on. Uh, we, we see, you know, our residents as our residents, right? We, we have community engagement, we hold town halls, uh, we get feedback from our school resource officers, you know, our, our deputy sheriffs are our frontline ambassadors uh, to everybody. Uh, we, as a station, went on a pretty strong social media campaign to say, hey, if you have a certain group, be it uh, faith-based, uh, property owners association, HOA, bowling team, pickleball, bunco crew, whatever it is, uh, call us, we'll come out. We'll come out, sit in your living room, answer questions, uh, engage with you, try to clear up all the misinformation that's out there. And, and we continue to do that you know, on a daily basis. I will tell you that we have surely had these talks. COVID kind of put a lot of that on ice, right? Because this, even, the, I don't like this. This, this doesn't do <laughs> it's very hard for me to interact with you. And, and we lose a lot of those, the, the human connection in this that I, I would like to have. I think this would be much more valuable if we were sitting across the table from each other or in person. It's just the way it is. It's just how things are right now that we get on the other side of it. I understand. Um, coming out of this COVID, when we are safe to meet face-to-face, -to, -face, to engage, human to human. Uh, yeah, we, we surely want to get that. We, we go to, you know, faith-based organizations and we go to community groups and we, we just have to be, the problem here is we have to be invited, right? It's hard. Like you just don't want us to show up in your house and go, Hey, you know, I heard you guys were having a family party and we thought you guys might want to talk to us. Right. We, we want, we want to get, we want to be, have that openness out there to where we get invited to something so that we can come and talk to you. Like I said, we're going to, within the next couple days, now that things are improving, is put out a pretty robust social media campaign to get people to come and ride along. Because what better way to you know, talk 
and engage the community and for the community to see exactly what it is that our deputies do every day and to hear from the residents on what they need from our organization than to have a mm -hmm. resident and a deputy paired up with the car together 12 hours or 10 hours or whatever. <laughs> and, and we would like to be invited out to things mm -hmm. like this. We love doing town halls because it's so educational on both sides, right? We don't know what we don't know and our residents don't know what they don't know. And there's so much misinformation out there. And when times are good, we don't go around telling everybody all the great things we think we're doing, right? And, and the residents don't really need it. Only after like some critical incident or some disaster or something bad happens, do we all start having these conversations. And we really need to be having them all the time. You know, we have a very symbiotic relationship with our community and these conversations need to continue and they need to continue in a, a space where everybody's comfortable, right? Our residents are comfortable and our deputy sheriffs are comfortable and, and, and people are comfortable speaking their minds and, and, and that respect and education goes both ways. So we are fully committed to that. And one of your questions to me was, how, how can you help us? Well, it's to get the word out, the word out that we want to be invited to whatever you're doing to get our information out and to hear from you so that you can, I can go, oh, I get it. And you can go, I understand. Because at the end, we'll both be in a better spot. Yes, I think that you brought up some uh, really important points about feeling that you need to be invited into spaces. I think that that was a really important point to make. But I also, I think simply just to note um, is to acknowledge the importance of the historicity of policing and people of color and how that relationship is particularly strayed. Um, and if I could make any particular type of recommendation to the sheriff department, I think that it would be of utmost value to create just like the LGBTQ um, commission or group that you have a commission that's focused on building um, your connection with, com uh, with your community of color that live in, in Riverside County. I think that's important. Um, and if I could, if I could continue on with the theme of um, community building and relationships, um, Riverside County Sheriff Department is under contract with Temecula, and there's a lot of conversations among uh, our citizens about the importance of community policing, because people feel that they want their police officers to know the names of their residents and build relationships because for many reasons just to be you know it builds legitimacy within the police department it also makes people just feel more comfortable um and it decreases the chances statistically that you'll have an unpleasant um interaction with um, with a citizen. So is there anything that the Riverside Sheriff Police Department is doing in order to build a particular relationship with Temecula residents? Is there the same police officers who service continually just this area? Are they primarily from this area? Um, any information that you could give me regarding that? Oh, yes. Uh, so keep in mind that I cannot speak for the larger organization in some of these areas. Like there could be a whole committee that's like meeting right now that's talking about just what you're talking about, right? <laughs> and I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to see an order come across my computer that says you're either A, going to build this or this is what's going to happen, <laughs> right? Because to, in some fashion, we're, we're very paramilitary, right? Uh, there's only so much I have parameters I'm allowed to operate in. Right. And, and I get, I get policy and procedures and I get direction and the sheriff is very committed to community relations. I'm sure you can see that on any one of his social media feeds and in these uh, community outreach groups we're building and things we're doing in the community. So it would not surprise me to know that there's not some group in our organization that's sitting around right now deciding how are we going to do this because it would be inappropriate for us to do it in Temecula but not do it in say Indio right because we're the entire county so we when we often roll out programs it's countywide 
you know, we like to we like to do things in in large scale. That being said, are those conversations occurring here? Absolutely. Uh, do we deploy deputies to the same zone all the time as often as possible? Right. There's a pride in ownership in that. We want them patrolling that same area all the time, learning who their residents are, interacting with the schools, the faith, the, the faith-based groups that are out there, the residents, knowing who's who, who who's kind of the troublemakers, and because the <laughs> residents know that and everybody, it takes that community to kind of solve those problems, right? We're not going to solve those problems by ourselves. So certainly all those all those things you discussed, we do talk about here. And we try to deploy deputies in this uh, community-based policing model of, of zone policing, uh, where they stay in the same area as often as possible. On top of that, yeah, I will tell you that a lot of deputies uh, that work here live here because this is an amazing area to live in. Uh, we don't mandate our deputies work in the area or live in the area they work, but they just do it naturally because who wouldn't want to live in this area? We both live in this area. A majority <laughs> of our station lives in this area. I'm a Temecula resident. A majority <laughs> of our department who isn't assigned here lives <laughs> in this area. So, so let me yeah. let me speak back on it. So I'm a big believer in in just meeting with people and sitting down and, and have a conversation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I shared with you earlier, and I won't get too far into the weeds on this, but I think it's it's worth noting here, right? This concept that you're talking about, community engagement and community policing, right? This is not new to us. Uh, when we decided that we needed to fix our relationships with the tribal communities here, the first thing we did was we went to the tribes themselves, to the elected officials and said, hey, here's our idea. This is what we're thinking. One, do you think this is a good idea? And two, if you do think it's a good idea, how should we go about this? Or what do you want from us, right? So stepping back away from this notion that we have all the answers, we don't, right? We understand that our relationships are broken. We don't have a connection to this community and we need to have one, right? In order to be able to actually provide quality law enforcement services to your tribal communities. So is it a good idea? If it is a good idea, then what if anything do you want from us? And how should we go about this? They told us, resoundedly, all 12 tribes. Yes, it's a good idea. And oh, by the way, just for the record, it's way overdue. You should have done this a long time ago. Understood. We asked them, what do you want from us? It was kind of interesting because we really thought we were going to hear, well, we need this and we need this and that. Um, to the point that you were making a minute ago, this is why I'm bringing it up. What they told us was very simply, we want you to tell the truth. So to which we responded, what truth is it that you are speaking of? And they told us very plainly, we want you to educate yourself and tell the truth about the relationship between government and the tribal communities in, in this country, in this country, in the state, in this county. And we said, well, we don't know what you're talking about. And they said, and there in lies the problem. So you need to educate yourself. You need to figure out what it is that we're talking about. And then let's sit down and start talking. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, when I was selected to go to this unit, I was overwhelmed. I didn't know anything about Indian country, about why we were there, our presence. But my broader point is this. We step back. We don't have all the answers. But what I'm saying to you is we will come, right? We will come and we will sit down and we will have thoughtful, respectful, uh, important conversations. And here's the goal. Uh, we need to build relationships with each other when things are calm, right? Because it is those relationships that we forge now and during periods of peace and calm that will allow us to weather when the storm comes. And it isn't if in this line of work, it's when, and that's just the reality of law enforcement. And I, and, and I would like to say that that's not true, but I've been doing this for 30 plus years and I know that that is the reality. So we have to uh, engage, we have to build relationships, we have to understand uh, where each other are coming from, understand the historical portion of what you're talking about, own it, right? But then also chart how we're gonna move forward together, right? How do we build this relationship together so that it works for everybody, right? Because in the end, it's not gonna happen by accident. Um, you wanna sit down and have a conversation with me or with the captain or anybody else, all you gotta do is call me. I'll meet you anywhere you want. I'll meet you for coffee, you can come here. 
we'll go anywhere. But that's where it starts. We have to sit down and be willing to have open and respectful dialogue with each other. And we uh, will admit readily that we don't have all the answers, right? But I'm willing to sit down and talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that it was really important um, to hear you talk about how you directly engaged with our indigenous populations um, to determine what worked and what didn't work and how to adapt in order to make um, in order to make them feel more comfortable and move forward. And um, I'm just gonna say, I'm sorry, y'all. I only have one more question left, <laughs> one more question left. Um, it is an absolute privilege to be sitting here with the sheriff department and to be able to ask um, questions. So I'm going to take advantage of it um, <laughs> while I have them, one more question. Um, so I think this is kind of my big one and I, I feel that everyone understands that um, over the last year and a half, um, there has been a change in attitude, um, societal expectations um, regarding policing, um, transparency, um, procedures. Um, how have you seen that reflected within the Riverside Sheriff's Police Department? What policies have changed um, or have addressed these calls for continued transparency just within these last year and a half, this last year and a half. It might be redundant, but I'm, I'm interested to see or hear the exact change that's gone through um, because of this now open dialogue um, about policing. Well, I mean, to be completely honest with you, uh, I would say we haven't changed much that wasn't already in progress uh, already, right? Mm. We were already uh, on the transparency route. We were already releasing body-worn camera footage. We were already putting all our deputies uh, in body-worn cameras. We were already sending our deputies to racial profiling, uh, discrimination, implicit bias, uh, tools for tolerance training. Uh, we were already doing uh, de-escalation training, right? Uh, enhanced uh, communication training, uh, crucial conversation training. We had already deployed mental health teams paired up with deputy sheriffs, right? Like, like all of these things that this brought to the forefront uh, when you sometimes hear in, you know, the reform or the defund, uh, I can tell you that Sheriff Bianco came into office, you know, like a wrecking ball and put almost all of these things into motion, which is why I can sit here with you today and say, hey, these aren't conceptual ideas with the exception of the special needs registry that we're still working on. These are things that are fully in play. The website's up, the reports are on there going all the way back to like 16, right? Uh, we're already seeing many, many of these critical incident videos already released. Uh, we removed the carotid restraint that did happen uh, as you know in the last uh, eight months or so uh, our mental health clinician paired up with the deputy sheriff has been going for at least a year and a half i was uh, on the baseline of the pilot program for that um one, one, think of anything else you know, one, one of the things to, to keep in mind uh, we've seen right the, these problems play out across our country in various jurisdictions and different states right and, and the truth of the matter is that, uh, and I'm just going to be blunt here, um, not all police agencies uh, are built the same, right? And, and, and just like every profession, right, there are varying degrees of how well they're trained and how successful they are and how educated they are and how good are they at their job. Who right? do we hire? Who do we hire, right? Uh, well, and to piggyback on that before we continue, the, our threshold for discipline and termination is is a factor, right? We hold people to a certain standard. Uh, the duty to intervene has right. existed in this organization long before it became something that everybody was talking about, right? So we had an override and intervention policy from all the way back to when I was training new deputies in early 2000. When I was when I was a training officer back in the early 90s, right? This, this, the, the concept of de-escalation 
was not new. We were training people to do it, right? Now, again, I'm not naive, and I understand that some agencies are just better at it than others, and some employees, individual employees, are better at it than others, right? But we have been tra training these concepts for years, right? I have to say that uh, for we are a large organization, we are a progressive organization, right? So we do all these things that the captain's already talked about, right, on the front end, hoping to have good results, right? Um, and then when we fall short of expectations, right, uh, then holding our people accountable, understanding that when we fail to do that, right, if as an organization, we lack the, the, uh, the moral fiber, right, to, to deal with problem employees, that is a disservice to the community we serve. It's problematic as a cancer on the organization. And so there's a zero tolerance to that. So we will give you all the tools that you need on the front end, understanding the dynamics of what's going on in our country and the trends and the things that are happening. We had already implemented all those things. And on the back end, we're gonna make sure that we're still holding our people accountable. To the captain's point, these are all things that we were doing, right? So now it's just a matter of ensuring that we're continuing, fine tuning and tweaking where we need to. Um, but uh, we are a very progressive organization in, the, in that regard. And I think uh, we hire well and uh, in my words, Sheriff Bianco's words are the best departments will have the best trained people and we are continually training our people, period. Yeah, and I can, I can tell you something we have done for sure is we've spent more time uh, explaining the things that we do or have been doing than we did in the past, right? Because there really, nobody was asking, so we didn't say. Now, mm -hmm. uh, we spent a lot more time doing community education and saying, hey, these, like you're asking and I'm saying, well, yeah, we've been doing these all along. How come nobody knew? Well, because they never asked and so we never said anything. But the reality is, is, is these things have been occurring for years. And, and certainly with Sheriff Bianco coming in and saying, hey, this is the standard and we're gonna meet this standard. And I know when I go home tonight, uh, I'm gonna go, you know, I forgot this or I forgot this. I should have said this. Okay, so, so something as simple as, you know, we, we talked about the importance of people filing complaints, right? They also function as what, what I refer to as an early warning system, right? So if I have a group of, of deputies, right? Let's say I take these 10 deputies and they all work in the city of Temecula, right? And they go out each day and they do their job, right? But I have one deputy who consistently I'm hearing about, he was rude, he was discourteous, he was doing a poor job. As a manager, that is a red flag for me, right? This is a potential problem in the making, right? So if it's predictable, it's preventable, right? And that's my job, right? To understand that and look at it and say, okay, before this really goes off the rails, let's unplug this person and find out, right? Maybe there's problems at home, maybe there's issues, right? But it's proactively managing those things before they become broader problems that explode, right, onto a national stage, right? Understanding that sometimes we do need to intervene and unplug somebody to say, hey, what's going on with this, right? So those complaints work as an early warning system for us. It allows me to kind of get a tempo. It's like, you should not be receiving that many complaints about how you're doing it because none of your peers are. So that tells me there's an issue with how you're operating, right? Not everybody you're encountering in the field should be you know, ending in some sort of a use of force or a complaint about how you're conducting yourself, right? So. Again, these are not new concepts. The captain mentioned, uh, I see uh, states now legislating, right? Legislating, hey, you have a duty to intervene. I, like, it's mind boggling to me that this has to be legislated. This is a human condition, right? I can arrive at a scene and look at something that's wrong and walk over and say to my partner, gently a hand on the shoulder, hey, you need to go take a break. Let me intervene here. We've been training that for years. This is not a new concept for us. This is something that is just expected that you do. We tell guys, watch your partner. When you see that he or she is losing their temper or they are at their wit's end, we are human. We are all human. And it's time for you to step in and say, we'll take a rest and we take over here for a few minutes, right? That's our duty. It's mind boggling to me that this has to be legislated uh, in other parts of the country. It just doesn't fit. We just, we just demand better of our people here. I absolutely agree. Um... I just want to wrap up. Thank you both so much um, for answering my questions. 
and your service to our community. I could keep you here all night with all my questions, but we got to move forward. So <laughs> thank you again. Of course. You're very welcome. Commissioner Faulkner, I see you unmuted yourself. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you for the brief. Uh, you know, very informative, very specific, and addressed a lot of our issues and concerns. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to have us uh, allow us to ask questions. Uh, first of all, I want to say happy Peace Officers Memorial Day and Police Week. Uh, uh, I appreciate what you do. I have a couple of friends of mine that, that are uh, members of the Riverside Sheriff Department, and uh, they speak nothing but great things about, you know, uh, the, the camaraderie, the esprit de corps, and also uh, just uh, working with the citizens across the uh, county of Riverside. So I uh, applaud you for that. Just had a couple of things. I mean, and, uh, I, uh, okay. Commissioner Harris stole out my thunder. <laughs> so... Hey, great to hear about all the things you guys are doing in the community. I mean, that is amazing. Uh, a lot of things you were talking about specifically hit what we're trying to work as a commission, right? You talk about a lot of things you talked about, you talk about inclusion, equity, uh, diversity, uh, and, and how you look at policing and, and how you go across the city of Temecula to make that happen. So I really appreciate that. Um, um, I looked at the crime stats and I am very pleased uh, uh, the crime stats in Jamaica and I think that's because of its citizens uh, interacting and having a relationship with one another, but also uh, an effort for your efforts of policing in the city as well and staying on top of things and ensuring that, you know, the higher things are a priority and we respond to them quickly. So uh, thank you for that as well. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is, I mean, when you're when you're hiring uh, police officers and they're coming into Riverside Sheriff's Department, you know, and uh, you know you're doing your background because I don't I don't I don't ever want to throw anybody away and not afford them opportunity. So when you talk about criminal history of someone trying to join your law law firm, what will preclude them, and what uh, even if they had something in their past, uh, what will preclude them from actually being able to become a Riverside Sheriff? Uh, even if they had something, you know, hiccup in the past as far as law enforcement goes, is, is that something that's off the table where they still could be hired and uh, be a, become a sheriff? Because I've heard stories about uh, police officers, sheriffs that had a history and were still allowed the opportunity. So I want to talk about that. Yeah, well, that's tough, right? Because I'm not a current day background investigator. I would have to get back to you on that. And okay. I think I, I would unfortunately give you like the attorney answer here, right? And say, it depends, right? It depends on how old they were, how serious the crime was. And uh, in a lot of cases, right? It's, well, what did you do after, right? right. Because some people will see, will we'll have, I mean, I, I wasn't the greatest kid, right? right? And maybe you go off to the military, you do a couple tours. Right. Maybe you, you're, unfortunately, you have to fight a war. And then you come back and now you're ready to raise a family. Well, you know, some of that stuff can be forgiven, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are some prohibitions, like you, you can't be involved in like domestic violence or like child pornography right. or right. sexual assaults. Like, I mean, there's there's some like obvious ones where you're like, well, that's, that's hard to say, well, I didn't know better, right? Uh, and so those people aren't going to get jobs in law enforcement. Uh, there's obviously some narcotic use issue, you know, that would preclude you from having a job in law enforcement. But uh, I, I think, like I said, there, while there are certain crimes, uh, it really is a totality of the circumstances of, well, you know, what happened? Where were you? How old were you? What, what were the circumstances? And then ultimately, at the end of the day, well, how did you recover from that, right? Because we all make bad decisions. We all fall sometimes, but it's how that person gets back up. And I know when I was a background investigator, uh, many times it was the background investigator's job to present that applicant and say, hey, look, I know he or she stumbled here, but let me tell you what's happened after that and what they've done to rebuild and rebrand themselves. And a lot of these people did. They went into the military, right? Or they went and got became educated or they raised a family. I mean, there are some mitigating circumstances to many of life's events. And so I know those are all taken 
uh, into account. Some we cannot get over, right? There's just no way. And you would be appalled if I told you, hey, let me tell you what Regali did when he was 22, but we hired him anyway, <laughs> right? You'd be like, well, that's not okay. You know, so I, I can't tell you specifically what those are. O overarching, right? Severity, yeah. uh, dur duration, and yeah. frequency, right? And so we can think about all the things that might uh, somebody might do that, that are uh, uh, plainly illegal, um, right? Because so again, severity, frequency, duration, right? right? How long ago in your past, hey, I did this, it was 12 years ago, and I've been a model citizen ever since, okay? Probably not going to be problematic. Uh, hey, I have been using narcotics regularly for the last four years, but I've been clean and sober for six months. Uh, probably not going to cut it, right? For for the obvious reasons. So yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I can tell. I'll put that. I'll I'll tell you what. A lot of the applicants I had that I disqualified for narcotic use were uh, they may have stopped using narcotics, but they were still hanging out with that same circle of friends, mm -hmm. right? And that would be problematic, right, mm -hmm. for hiring. Because you, you want to say, hey, you're doing these illegal activities. We want that time and distance from that and, you know, some lifestyle change. Even something no. as, as simple as, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I appreciate that because uh, I asked the question because I had a lot of military friends who had, you know, a background, came the military, did well got out, went to law enforcement, and were accepted with no problems because they showed a history of pattern of discipline, uh, high performance appraisals, which means they showed they recovered. Uh, so, and it opened up an opportunity with the policing and with the sheriff's department. So, uh, yeah, so it's glad to hear that, I mean, there, someone can have a hiccup and not be excluded from an opportunity. So right. it all depends on what it is. Yeah, so, driving can be kind of problematic for us as well, right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, DUIs and or uh, a, uh, prolonged periods of, of citations for reckless driving, excessive speed, that thing, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we're gonna train these guys to be deputy sheriff, I'm gonna put them in a black and white, it's in yeah. right? That kind of okay. stuff. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, one of the things I wanna talk about is uh, taking politics out of policing. I mean, is, is that something, uh, that's something that's talked about within the, uh, within the you know, Riverside Sheriff Department in regards to, uh, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, we're, we're a police officer now. Uh, and we need to, you know, do they talk about making sure that, yeah, that you're not a Republican Democrat, you're a police officer and you need to police specifically in the middle. Uh, and, and, and that's how you should be looking at uh, anyone you're dealing with on the street and not keep your personal, keep your personal uh, preferences to yourself and, and, and engage your citizens as just that, your citizens. So I just want to see what you thought about that. Yeah, absolutely. If it would be embarrassing if I was to sit here and tell you through this last year, we never had those discussions, right? Because I have never in my 20 something years had a year that had the political turmoil, right? That this last year did. We, we had many conversations, many conversations with staff that we don't, we don't, you don't, you don't, you don't treat a resident differently because of how they may or may not vote. Right. Uh, yes, we certainly, uh, we probably had those conversations daily. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I walked in on briefings, I sat on briefings, supervisors were having those conversations. Uh, and, you know, we vote on both sides of the aisle in this building. I know people, people generally think that's not true, but, you know, we have both sides in here. And, and, and to keep that out of this building, as well. So yes, we many, many conversations about that. All right. Great. Thanks a lot for that. Um, and, and I want to uh, get rid of this 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 this, this conversation, uh, whether it's in the Citizen Medical or anywhere else. And, uh, and, and it's great hearing it straight from you. Uh, <laughs> we're already commissioned race, equity, diversity, inclusion commission. There has never been a situation where I think I think every citizen wants fiscal responsibility with policing. And also with its uh, leadership, but there was never a call for us or this commission or the city to say we're going to defund the Riverside Sheriff's Department. Have you have you had any conversations about? It? Has anybody ever brought that to you? Well, no. Well, yeah. I mean, we we've heard community members talk about it. I've been to town halls where they've asked about it, uh, and and I my response is always the same. It's 
it's, I think when you talk like the academics and you talk to senior leadership management, uh, it's not really defunding, right? We're talking about a reallocation of funding in some areas like to the mental health cars, uh, community outreach program, mm -hmm. things like that. And that's conversations again, I, we've been having for a decade, right? We, everybody I have a conversation with, we talk about, hey, there's a lot of calls that law enforcement tasked with responding to that we don't want to go to either. I mean, we do, right? But the system's kind of set up where, hey, if it's not on fire, the police go, right? And we think there's probably some there in the middle that there's probably somebody else that's better equipped, better trained, better educated, and a better fit to respond to that. Mm -hmm. But nobody thinks that getting rid of police right. or reducing police is a good idea. Right. However, there's probably some middle ground there that we could better serve our residents with a different response. Yes. Thank you for that response. That, that, that is right on target. And I just want the citizens of Temecula to hear that from the Riverside Sheriff's Department uh, on how you how that began to find and how that's uh, there's you know a, a narrative out there that you know really not really defining that. And I wanted you guys to be able to find that on this on at this commission. I'm glad you brought that up and I'm glad and you said it well in regards to reallocation of funds in different areas to ensure that we're policing it. And what you just described was inclusion, right? So there are other areas of policing that we need to stay, uh, focus on and we need to share resources in those areas as well. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and, and to just to add another layer to that, yeah. here locally uh, with like, it, you know, Aaron Adams, the city manager, we've had many talks mm -hmm. and, and engineered uh, the local law enforcement, uh, their contract to have like CBAT, that's the clinician with the deputy sheriff, a domestic violence specialist response team that works with the DA, with victims advocate, with SAFE, with other non-governmental uh, organizations to provide those middle ground services where maybe, maybe the justice system isn't needed here or is not the best fit, but really that's all we got. So let's take the law enforcement officer with a specialist in that area and put them in there to solve that problem. And, and that's something that the city and Aaron Adams can be credited with coming forward and saying, hey, we need this in our community, asking the sheriff's department here, hey, can we do this? Well, absolutely, let's give it a try. And we've done that with our problem oriented policing team, with our hot team, that's a perfect example. The homeless outreach team, which we didn't even talk about much, it, you know, they work with many faith-based organizations, SWAG, NGOs to go out there and provide services, not a jail cell, to some of these community members that need assistance. Mm. So that so, speaks directly to what you're saying. Well, well, maybe as an industry, we haven't decided, okay, let's shift this money away or shift these resources around. We have decided that, hey, there, there is a local need here. Mm -hmm. How can best do it with what we have now. Yeah. And I, and I applaud you on your outreach efforts because that, that showed in your brief and the things you're doing. And I know Hot and Swag in Temecula has been doing an amazing job. Uh, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to get a walk around with them at some point in time. I'm definitely going to take you guys up on the ride along as Absolutely. well. I, uh, I did that when I was on active duty when I went to Fallon, Nevada. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to police our sailors when they're up there, you know, alcohol starts to fly. And guess what, you know, and, and, we, and the police officers, uh, I was a chief and I rode up with them and the police officers would address the sailor. And then all of a sudden he, he's acting, you know, belligerent to the police officer. Then I jump out of, the, out of the car with my uniform on and guess what? It changed the whole dynamic. That sailor popped up tall, had attention. Uh, hey, hey chief, how's it going? I'm like, oh, no, don't, how are you going? Me, you were just acting crazy with the police officer. Act crazy with me because we're going back to the base and we're going we're gonna to handle this situation. So I think I think uh, you know it'll be good to just uh, just ride, get a ride along and just see what, see what you guys go through a day in the life of Riverside Sheriff. So, so I definitely will I'll be reaching out with you and uh, and doing that uh, with the uh, body cams. And uh, I know you brought up the fact that you know the sheriffs work longer than the body cams to be charged. Uh, it will keep charged, but when they're driving and they're not interacting with citizens, are they able to plug that up and charge it so it lasts a this entire shift? I don't. I'm just asking a question because I don't know if there's the ability that when they're driving and not interacting with citizens, they're able to plug that in, charge it to ensure that it lasts the entire 
the entire ship. So, yeah. That's, that is an excellent question. And the, the short answer is they do not have the ability. So, so the BWCs that we're using right now are the last generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are, as a department, uh, again, that the captain had alluded to earlier, right? Uh, a lot of our programs are department wide, right? So they are in negotiations, RFPs out on new systems, right? Better equipment. The equipment that we're using right now are still very robust, but they are last generation, right? And as they are nearing their uh, life cycle, right? The end of their life cycle, this generation did not have that component to be able to do it. So consequently, the deputies play this kind of game of trying to put it in standby mode, run it, and that kind of stuff to preserve the battery for as long as they can of that 12 hour uh, period. Okay. But not have the ability to be able to charge in the car. Okay. And are those, so are those, all those, are those recordings uh, archived and in the database every time they have the interaction just in case you need to go back, you know, a year or two years, uh, just in case a case comes up and they need that video? How long, how long do you guys keep that in archive? It's automatically saved for a year and a half. And then there's the, like in a criminal case, all those are burnt to a CD and put into evidence or a deputy, a supervisor, a manager, or me can go into the system and put a hold on the video. And then it's not deleted until we release the hold. Okay, thank but you. But generally, like if you're talking about misconduct, right? That's gonna come out within a year and a half. Okay. You know, most people don't pop up two, right. three years later and go, hey, back then, right. this happened. Got you. No, thanks we, for that. You know, yeah, we, I'm seeing a lot of cities, a lot of cities are, you know, trying to come up with policies to prevent citizens from recording incidents with police officers. And, uh, you know, and I know that the CAM gives it from the police's, police perspective of what's happening. Uh, but um, what are your thoughts about that? in regards to citizen video taking interactions with police officers that they think may put themselves in harm's way. And how was that looked at? Because I think on both sides of this is the fact that okay, the police officer has this evidence in regards to what happened, uh, but someone videotaping for the citizen to make sure from their perspective uh, and how their interaction with yeah, uh, you are we're videotaped all, I mean, we're videotaped all the time, right? By residents. Uh, the citywide camera systems, uh, surveillance cameras of businesses, like like we assume, like most of anybody really should, that when you're out in public, you're probably on a ring.com camera yeah. or somebody is running. A lot of people run their own dash cams. Right. Uh, we have no problem with it. Uh, I'm going to jump in this because again, uh, being overseeing the, 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 yeah. patrol, the patrol environment, uh, Absolutely. Uh, we want the public. The public has a right to film us doing our job. We are public employees. We are uh, providing a service to the community. You absolutely, citizens, have a right to uh, record us, right? There is no expectation of privacy when I'm conducting business in my official capacity. Right. But uh, as the saying goes, uh, the devil's in the details, right? So right. let's talk a little bit about that. Um, if I'm trying to do something, interact with somebody, whether it's a traffic stop or a call, and I'm trying to focus and keep myself safe, keep the people safe, right? And a citizen who's not involved stops and wants to record me, totally good with that. What I would say is be respectful of that. Understand that my safety is on the line. The people I'm dealing with, their safety is on the line. Stand at a safe distance, right? I think where the problem comes is, is that people interpret, I have a right to film you, as meaning I get to run up and stand a foot away from you yeah. and stick my phone, you know, two feet from your ear and scream at you the whole time while you're trying to do your job. And what I would say to you is that's just not, is not safe for anybody, right? nor does it allow me to focus on what I need to do. So by all means, please do uh, yeah. film me all you want, record me all you want. Just do it at a safe it distance. Right. Right. And do it safely. Right. Yeah. And the last thing I got now, and, and I'm going to be quiet. I think I went long enough. Is the the carotid restraint that we were talking about? I know it's it's going to be it's banned or it's it's, it's not used. So is that carotid? Was that carotid uh, restraint uh, from you putting your arm around the carotid and and and, and to, you know and, and making the uh, the assailant pass out, or was it 
you could that could be transitioned to a need on a carotid. So I asked that question because I don't know the difference. So uh, if you could explain that, what is what is sure. that carotid restraint? The, the only way we were allowed to apply the carotid is from a rear position, right? With this, the like I said, the soft parts of the arm, right, on the neck, right, from behind the person while we were like on the ground. Yeah, and that was just it. It was only the arm, right? That's and, only the arm, and so and we could apply it when we were on the ground so that we didn't fall, right? right? Because if we fought, we fell, and the person was unconscious, they could be injured. Or if they went unconscious while they were standing and they they drew their weight drop, they could be injured. So we had to apply it on the ground behind them with just the soft part of the arm. Okay, that was it. And that I, was the only way. Yeah, and I just asked. I just asked. I'm a medical guy. I'm a healthcare administrator. Did my whole time in the military with the Navy, so I understand the anatomy and physiology. I understand the two carotids that provide oxygen to the brain. Even the restraint is dangerous. Uh, and I say, I, I tell you why, is because of the fact that that law enforcement office doesn't know the medical condition of the person they're restraining and using that, even, even if they're if, even if they're out of control. And the problem is you don't know if he has a, a, a cardiovascular condition. You don't know how blocked his arteries are, her, his or her arteries are blocked. And even, even, that, even that position, even doing that for, for a short period of time could cause uh, could cause a problem. So I know I want you guys to be protected, you know, you know and, and by other, whatever it means. I know when you get in, there's a lot of people I will miss mix martial arts training, and it's going to be, a, it's going to take a lot to get them down. And I want you to be safe because I want both parties to go home. And I know in that situation, you have got to do what you need to do to be safe and get home. But I, 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 I really don't like the carotid, the, even the carotid uh, restraint along with you know, what we've seen in the media. Uh, I'm glad, I'm hoping there's a different way they can train uh, in regards to uh, self-defense for law enforcement officers to be able to control a person which, I mean, with training, miss martial arts training, because I think you need more, all your law enforcement officers need more training because a lot of these guys are, are getting this training and it's, it, it could take more than one or two officers to bring them down. So uh, I'm hoping they're giving you some different type of uh, uh, ability to restrain to keep yourself safe and also keep the citizens safe as well so both of you go home and with that being said I'll, I'll let you comment and, uh, and that's the last question I have yeah and I just you know and I, I can't argue with anything you said everything you said is a hundred percent accurate and uh, the carotid restraint was literally right under if you could thought and we don't really have a force continuum per se right because situations dictate force but if you, if you put on the bottom of the continuum, like your presence there is the bottom and a firearm is the top, right? Carotid was just below that. Mm -hmm. so, so you had all these other options available to you, but you're like, hey, I'm getting to the point where I may have to shoot this person to survive. I'm gonna try the carotid before we get to that. Yeah. That's, that was the level yeah. the carotid was at. Yeah. So, so I'll, all, I'll, go ahead. all of our use of force and, uh, incidents, right, are reviewed by the manager. It comes through. Uh, I have to review all the reports. They go to BWC. Uh, again, I'm only speaking about our organization, our department. Uh, I, I don't really see the carotid restraint being used anymore. What, what I see is usually there are a number of officers. We got a bunch of people grabbing an arm and then this arm and a leg, and then everybody tumbles to the ground, and now we're wrestling, trying to wrestle an handcuff. Overwhelmingly, that's most of the use of forces. The other ones that we see uh, is the use of the taser. Uh, the taser is a more modern uh, tool that has been introduced in, in, into our environment. And more often than not, uh, we will see a taser being deployed. Uh, obviously, it mobilizes a person long enough to walk over to them, roll them on their stomach, and put them in handcuffs, right? But again, we train our people like you don't leave them there like that, right? So immediately once they're handcuffed and they are secured, immediately bring them up to a seated position or you get them up or you do something, you don't leave them face down. You don't lay on top of them uh, for extended periods of time. We just don't train to do it that way. We immediately seat somebody up and make sure that their airway is not constricted, their chest can move up and down uh, and they can breathe. And of course, 
uh, immediately uh, ask for medical aid if, if that's uh, appropriate. Yeah. Hey, thank, no, thank you. I, I definitely will. I'm, I'm like uh, <laughs> uh, Commissioner Harris. I'll be reaching out to have those conversations that you guys have offered. So, because uh, I got a ton of more questions, but I'll leave it open to the next, my, my uh, fellow commissioners. To jump and in. I do want to throw out, just because we're talking about force here, uh, uh, our, our force incidents are very rare. Like, like it, it's, not, it's not even a daily occurrence here, right? We don't use force on our hundreds and hundreds of contacts a day. We don't use force in hardly any of them. Every use of force here is reported. It's a reportable use of force that, that their supervisor reviews, the manager reviews, they watch the camera footage, they read all the reports. Like this isn't something that just happens all the time. A very limited amount of our interactions result in some kind of force use. And, and generally those are in an arrest and it's only a limited number of our arrests that actually end up with some kind of force being used. So it's, I don't think it's as frequent as an occurrence as most people believe. And it usually involves somebody being uh, intoxicated or under the influence of some sort. And so they're not really thinking clearly, not, not willing or able at some point to just follow basic instructions. And then, you know, as we go to take somebody into custody for some other offense is when the problem occurs. And it's usually a takedown to the ground you know, three three officers grabbing a hold of an arm and leg and putting putting somebody in handcuffs, and then it's over with. Right. The limited we have, so begin with we have a limited amount of force uses anyway, and then those limited amounts of force are usually the the vast majority of those are very minor. Uh, the times that uh, somebody gets hurt in one of our force issues is even way 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 less than that. Most of these are just like little scuffles, right? Like you said, grabbing an arm, rolling around the ground a little bit, and nobody gets hurt. The deputies don't get hurt, and uh, the residents being taken into custody doesn't get hurt. And so you're talking about very small numbers to a very small number to a very small number. So, and I know that gets that gets missed sometimes in these discussions. But like I said, out of our thousands and thousands of contacts a week, uh, we're talking about a very very small percentage that ends in some kind of force. And then even if it does, it's a very minor, minor use of force. Okay, who's next? Commissioner Steve, did you raise your hand? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So I just wanted um, kind of a couple of clarifications on some, some things that I just wanted to ask a couple of questions also. Um, first of all, Captain Hill and Lieutenant um, Rigali, we appreciate your time and the service that you give to our community. Um, we love being in our homes and being safe. We love shopping and being safe. We love driving our cars and being safe. Mm -hmm. And so we appreciate you. Your job is my worst nightmare. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I have great respect for the job that you do and the work that you do. You my mom does the same thing. <laughs> you risk your lives potentially every day and we appreciate that. Um, so some of the questions I have um, are just on your slides. Um, you had community behavioral assessment team. What does that mean? That is where we have a mental health clinician in the car with a deputy sheriff. And they try to be the first responder to calls where people are suffering with, through some kind of mental health crisis. Okay, so that's the same as your CBAT. I did not get that, so now I know. There you go. Uh, as an example, here, here's a routine uh, situation where this, uh, these two uh, employees would respond. Uh, a, a family member calls Sheriff's Dispatch and says, my brother, who is schizophrenic or has some other mental health issues, has not been taking his medication. I'm worried about him. He is delusional. He's banging his head on the wall in the room. Will you please send the police? Well, we will send this group, this duo there first with the hope that having the clinician there be able to speak to this person, right? Because this is what he or she is trained to do to resolve that peacefully, right? We still have the deputy there to be able to intervene if necessary, but we allow them the opportunity to get this person the help that they need 
right? That doesn't necessarily uh, have us be the face of that immediately, unnecessarily. And even a better example of where they're more useful and a better tool for us is we go out on what's called like a 5150. This is somebody that is a danger to themselves or somebody else, right? So maybe they're 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 suffering through a mental health issue and you know they're waving a knife around, right? Or they've cut their wrists. That's very easy for a deputy to look at and go, hey, this person needs a psychiatric intervention, right? Take them to an emergency treatment center and drop them off. Uh, so on the opposite side of that is like a mom that calls the police and goes, hey, I, I think my daughter's not okay. Uh, she's you know maybe sleeping a lot. Uh, I think she may be taking something. I'm worried about her. She kind of said she didn't want to live anymore, but she didn't really. So a deputy goes out there and they're like, hey, are you okay? And the daughter's like, yeah, but the deputy's like, well, but I don't think you are. So it's not clear cut enough for this deputy to say, okay, I'm going to place you on an emergency hold. In those cases, now you can bring in the CBAT team, right? Where, where we would normally go, okay, I'm going to leave. But like now the deputy can't, doesn't really have the legal justification to do anything, but they now get to go, man, I really hope something bad doesn't happen to that little girl. Right. Or something bad does happen. And now our deputy's traumatized too. And the family's traumatized, but we have CBAC. So CBAC can go over there and the clinician and the deputy who's specially trained, they can sit down and go, well, how are you doing? What, what is going on? Do you need something? And then instead of taking them to like the county emergency treatment center, they can take them to like a children's hospital, like chalk or rabies, because they have all these connections with these people and go, Hey, look, she doesn't, she doesn't even know what's wrong, but we can tell, and she can tell, and her mom can tell there's something wrong here. We need to come up with some kind of intervention plan to help this child and educate the family on what to watch for and the warning signs. And, and then we become a proactive part of this solution, you know, versus sending a deputy sheriff who is like, hey, did you try to kill yourself? You didn't. You're not going to kill yourself? Okay, I hope I don't see you again. Right. And then they're both worried. They're worried the deputy's going to come back. The deputy's worried this person's going to kill themselves after they leave. But with CBAT, they can go in there and they, you know, they have this clinician, they have a deputy sheriff, and they can go, well, let's let's take you down to chalk. How about your mom drives you? We'll just follow. And you can talk to a doctor. And then that is a much better outcome for everybody. The deputies aren't traumatized, the family's not traumatized. Uh, hopefully this child doesn't do something rash that's going to affect the rest of their life. And we have a much more sustainable, positive outcome. And that's for like, I get what he's saying is very important to me. There's an unbelievable value in, in that preemptive, uh, you know, stabilization of that system. And that's, that's where I see the greatest value in CBAT. I love it. I love it. Okay, you um, mentioned an LGBT liaison. What does an LGBT li liaison do? We have a, uh, uh, I don't know how many there are now assigned to this LGBT liaison, uh, like outreach team, but they, they interact with the LGBT community. Hey, what, what are, what, are, what do you need from the sheriff's department? What's going on in the community? What can we do to help? Uh, not, not unlike we would do with like a homeless outreach or uh, any other community outreach group. That just happens to be the group that deals with uh, the LGBT community. That's interesting. I, I, you wouldn't expect there would, there would be a specific liaison for the LGBT community, but I'm sure it has a huge purpose. And I appreciate your compassion for the different groups. I think it's really important in how we police and how we um, take care of our community. Um, having said that, your um, efforts with the special needs community is just outstanding, starting the database um, so we can really be in tune with our community. Um, and then your work with the sovereign tribal nation, um, being non-uniformed um, and just being able to have those conversations and ask, what do we not know? What are we not getting here? And being open to those answers. Um, again, the homeless outreach, I mean, I've watched you guys do that for years and it's been tremendous the effort that you're putting forth um it's a huge problem in our community and in the in the county and we appreciate that work and the compassion and the empathy that goes behind it 
Um, so as I'm listing through these groups, um, writing right on what Commissioner Harris said, there's a glaring um, gap in not partaking or not having that special group um, mentality when it comes to our community of color. Um, perception is everything and whether it's true or not, perception is everything. So if children of color fear our police instead of respecting our police, I think we have a huge gap there. And um, I think it's a great opportunity for us to um, really go into our schools, work with our Boys and Girls Club, and really build those strong relationships. So our next generation growing up, and again, we're a tiny little Temecula when you look at the grand scheme of things, but we want our next generation growing up to not feel that way. We don't want them to feel fear because when you feel fear, we don't know what your reaction is going to be. And when the police person feels threatened or feels fear, then we don't know what the reaction is going to be. So I think there's really education needed on both sides. So I really do see a huge gap there. And what can we do about that? Um, I will tell you a story, and I've shared this with a couple of the commissioners, but um, a couple of years ago, there was an incident and it was heartbreaking and a young man was um, shot by a police officer and it was, it was just a horrible situation. And my, I'm a white lady with two white boys. And my reaction is, um, when a police officer pulls, officer pulls you over, you put your hands on the wheel, you shut your mouth, you do what you're told, right? And in my world, that's what you do. And I read an Instagram post by one of my friends online, and she happens to have um, a mixed race family. So she is a white woman like me, and she has three white kids, and she has two kids of color. And her statement was, she will never have to have the conversation with her young black boy that she has to have with her, with her young white boys. Like white boys, do you, right? Behave yourself, be good, da, 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 da. But the young black man, like she has to treat him different and teach him different to go out into the world. And again, I'm not saying this is a local problem, but I believe if we start making changes locally and hopefully that spreads. Um, I mean, I don't know if you have kids, but for me having kids and hearing that it, broke my heart and it changed my perception of how I think about everything. And it, these are young children. Um, and it, again, it emphasizes that gap and that fear within the community of color as opposed to um, many of our other community members. So while I appreciate that you see our community as a whole, there is definitely segments that view your policing different or view your reaction to them different. And that's something that we need to kind of get on top of and we need to solve. So what are your um, thoughts on that? And again, I know <laughs> you guys don't make the rules and there's the whole thing going on behind you and you don't know what they could say tomorrow, but are those conversations happening? Again, it's a gap. When, when we talk about all the groups that we're helping, it's a gap of a group that we're not really addressing. Oh, certainly those conversations are taking place. And like I said, the, these talks may uh, be occurring at an executive level, but they're certainly occurring at our station level. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm trying, unfortunately, like when we realize like, hey, uh, we, we've got to get it in front of this, right? Uh, there's people out there that need us, that need to have these conversations that we need to engage with. Uh, we got hit with COVID, right? So we've all been kind of hanging out, uh, waiting for it to, to lift so we could say, okay, let's let's get out in the communities. Uh, let's let's build, you know, let's build these groups, right? We're going to need, like I said, it, it really, for us, to some degree, like I'll put out there that we're willing to meet. We got to have somebody in the community that's willing to get people that want to have, like on the resident side, want to engage with us want to have these conversations. We try to start at the faith-based groups, right? Because that's where they're already bringing people together and we can go there. We tried with HOAs, we tried with like Rotary Clubs and all, all this. And we we just need to get the word out to the community that let's, let's have these meetings. Let's start these discussions because if we can have these discussions with four or five people and we've had them with like NAACP, ACLU, we had them at the city building, 
when this thing all started. And, and then we realized with that group, we were kind of good. They're like, hey, we're okay. Okay, we're good. We, you got what you needed from us. We got what we needed from you. We're good. Uh, we'll check in with you if you need something. And then it kind of dies because it doesn't go to the next level, right? And we need those people to go, okay, everybody in this room, now you go out and set up a meeting. It'd be like a, like a, like a, the Amway, like a tiered marketing, right? Okay, everybody in here, now you guys go out and you host a meeting and we'll come there. And then we can have all those people host meetings and we can, you know, we can just get, we can get everybody to kind of know everybody, know where everybody's coming from. That way when, you know, we do have one of these incidents or we run into somebody that's, you know, having a bad day, right? Because that's sometimes, unfortunately, when we show up is you're not having a great day. You don't often run into a policeman when everything's going great, just like you don't run into a fireman. But I would like, it would be great if our deputies knew these people already. Like, oh, hey, I know your mom, or hey, I remember I met you that night, or they're like, oh, hey. And we see that with our like hot team, right? Because that's kind of a revolving crowd of the same people. They know them all by name. The rapport is already there. We have almost no incidents of force within the homeless community of people that are suffering from mental health illness, sometimes suffering from drug addiction, because the deputies, they know, they all know each other. They're like, oh, hey, Sam, what's up, Steve? You know, it, unfortunately, you know, it's, that would be much easier to do in a community of 7,500 people, right? You, you have 120,000 people. It's going to take a lot more work. I'm telling you now, we're willing to put in that work. We want to have those meetings, uh, those community meetings. Let's do it. Let's start. We want to build our volunteer forces. We want to build our citizens on patrol. We want to build our neighborhood watches. We want the youth of our communities in our explorer programs. Like we want to build and advertise those communities. We were set to steamroll all of this stuff just with a real barrage on the community, and then COVID kind of caught us. So now. We're having these strategic planning meetings of how do we engage the community in these crucial and sometimes difficult conversations? You know, how do we build this trust capital out there in the communities? And so, yeah, we're fully committed, but literally it is going to need your, I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need clergy's help. I'm going to need uh, community leaders' help to, to get the word out that, hey, we're, we're ready to meet. When and where do you want to do it? I'll find the place. Okay, awesome. No, I think that's a great answer. And it's it's exactly what I really wanted to hear. And, and I hope that um, your organization can use our already commission as a vehicle to help you with that mission, because that's why we're here. I love that you're here tonight. I've been waiting to talk to you guys and have this open and honest conversation. And, and you really have warmed my heart because your answers have been so transparent so honest, so forthright. I hope that the people are watching have been educated on how you feel about the word defunding that is not even a real word um, and have, have actually heard that answer because it was so valuable. Um, it's never been mentioned here. And so I'm glad that you took a time to really express um, what that means to you as a police organization and that you have a full understanding of what it should mean to everybody else as well. So thank you for that. Um, the other thing, um, just one thing I have left and it is, I worry about our policemen too. I don't want you guys to burn out. I don't want you guys to um, get to a stage where you can't handle your positions. And so I'm assuming there is, and I'm hoping there is some kind of um, a program that you can keep an eye on um, your fellow officers so they don't get to a stage where mistakes are made or, or bad things happen. Uh, we want you to be mentally healthy, physically healthy, um, so you guys can do your jobs. Well, I, I will tell you uh, that I am the commander of our department's peer support program. Uh, we have over 80 peer supporters within our organization, uh, as well as uh, Counseling Team International, which is a professional counseling uh, corporation. Uh, they're based in San Bernardino, where we have an open contract with them, where any one of our department members, their spouses, or their children can go there and get free counseling, whether it be marriage, whether it be work-related, whether it be a PTSD, uh, critical injury therapy, uh, just basic mental health checkups uh, at no charge to them or their families uh, through our peer support program. 
Every station in the department has peer supporters in every rank classification, sworn, non-sworn, support, dispatch, coroners, office assistants, accounting, the sworn ranks, everywhere. Uh, we did a very uh, intense recruiting and then training program to get all of these peer supporters up and running. Uh, and we not only have peer supporters here, but we long, belong to a peer support coalition uh, in the Southern California area where we loan our peer supporters out to other agencies and they loan theirs out to us uh, in case somebody in our organization wants to talk to a peer supporter but doesn't want to talk to somebody in our own organization because maybe it's a little too close to home that they can borrow uh, a peer supporter from another organization. And then on top of that, like I said, once at some point a peer supporter uh, can't really listen anymore and they we can refer them over to professional therapy uh, that is free uh, to the employee. Uh, and so far, we've had some employees that have had almost unlimited uh, sessions that the sheriff's department has paid the bill. Uh, and that is something else that Sheriff Bianco kicked off and wanted everybody in this organization to have access to counseling and therapy, not only for just them, but for their entire families free of charge and totally confidential outside of county services, right? Because before you went to a department or county therapist or counseling, and that made everybody super nervous. And this is confidential outside our organization and you can take your whole family. We just know so much more today um, and, and we're willing to uh, acknowledge right, and confront that uh, our employees are people, right, and they're subject to all the things, to all the heartbreaking things that, that we encounter and that we see over, over a period of years. Uh, and we just do a much better job of caring for our people now than we did like when I first started. There was, there was none of these services existed uh, when I first started. Uh, we were just expected to absorb and go back to work, absorb and go back to work. Um, and then that we realized now today that this is not possible and that uh, there are employees that today uh, experience traumatic things that require uh, help so that they can be okay to come back and do their jobs effectively, right? We're just so much smarter about it yeah. today. And one of the best ways I can explain it is like when we first came on law enforcement, like it was, it was not cool to get hurt at work, right? If you got hurt at work, you took some Advil or whatever, you taped it up and you came to work. And we were told to leave your problems at home and work-related injuries were problems. Well, in like the first 10 years, they decided, well, hey, a work-related injury, there's some legal things we have to do here. And it's in our best interest to take care of our employees' physical injuries. Well, in the last few years, we've learned that a, a, a physical injury and a brain injury are very similar. And our employees suffer traumatic brain injuries from some of the things that they see or they deal with or the reoccurring trauma that they're thrust into, right? Because like I said, we're not often seeing people on their best days. And so now we're handling these brain injuries almost like we would a physical injury where it's in our best interest to make sure our employees are the best versions of themselves, right? Fully, fully healthy, fully healed, fully emotionally stable and 100% in the game, right? Because the, the human rubber band can only handle so much, right? And, and when it gets stretched out, that's when you see you know, some bad decisions. And you, and you ask the employee, well, what happened? It was like, well, it's just too much. And so now we're very committed to ensuring that no matter what's going on in their personal life or their professional life, they never get to the point where it's too much. And if it is, he, he I have 20 people here in this building, supervisors and managers that are trained to watch and go, uh, we got to pull this person out of the game. Not unlike a football team, right? That person's limping. They have to come out. Whether it's a physical limp or it's a mental limp, it's time to sideline them for a little bit and figure out what we can do for this employee. And, and there, there's, no, there's no hazing anymore. There's no making fun of them. Everybody understands that brain injuries are legitimate. And if you don't take care of them, it will become a far worse problem for you. So we're very attuned to that. And again, that's something new that's coming out in discussions. I can tell you now we've been doing it for years. We had, we had to finally acknowledge that for uh, all the peace officers that we have who are killed in the line of duty every single year. And there's usually 
a few hundred across the country. Uh, we have more than double that number that take their own lives uh, at home, uh, in the front seat of a patrol car, uh, in the locker room. Uh, and this is uh, a reality that not many of us will talk about, uh, but it is our reality and we've had to deal with it. High rates of divorce uh, and uh, alcoholism and the things that come with it when, right, we are not proactively taking care of those people the right way, right? The, uh, all the points that Captain uh, Hall just made. Uh, we, we realized that uh, what we were just not doing it right. We needed, we needed to do this differently and, and make sure those people were okay. Well, that's definitely commendable and, and your leadership is just outstanding. So thank you for taking care of your people too, because I think that's really important. Um, and I know us as a commission that we are honored to have you here and we look forward to a, a long and fruitful relationship with you. We want to work together and, and make everybody's lives better. So thank you for being here tonight. We truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson, you lean forward. You're leaning in for the mic. Yeah, you know what? I'm just gonna be very brief. I just wanted to thank you guys for an excellent presentation. Um, this evening, you were very, very thorough and you um, answered basically all the questions that I had. But there was one thing about the special needs registry. How do we go about signing up or getting that information to our community? Well, that's, that's the part we're still working on. And the reason that is, is because our com computer aided dispatch, right? The, the computerized system that record management's all the addresses and who's who, we're mm -hmm. process to get a new one of those. So we're trying to decide now, okay, do we go with like a paper system that we manually input in this system? Do we wait for the new system to come online where we can do a public facing portal on the internet where you can just register? Are we gonna have you come into the station to register? And the only reason I really know anything about this is because I was charged with creating this process and managing the action team that was gonna put it together. Uh, and okay. so that's, it's still in its infancy stage of the build of, okay, so now we, we know conceptually what we wanna do. We built this committee of, and, and the committee, the action group was not just law enforcement, right? We brought in uh, members from the community that had special needs family members and said, okay, what do you need from us? What, what would you like to see us do? And that's how we built this system that now we just have to decide, okay, how are we going to input the data to it? And how are we going to export the data from it in a reasonable fashion, right? Because we really need it by the time you call 911, I need the system to recognize that you have that information in the system okay. and the deputy with a picture, because if you have an autistic child that elopes and heads to the freeway or, or for some water source, I need to know, I don't need to go to your house. I need to get to the lake because that's where the child's going. And so there's a, there's a very important workflow process that we need to knock out before we roll this thing out. Thank you so much for that answer. Very, very thorough. Um, and the last thing was, I would love to do a ride along with your program. I think there's a lot that um, can be shared with us. And I think we'll also let us see what you guys go through on a 12 hour shift. You, and you, you and any resident is welcome anytime. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Great presentation again. Yes. Commissioners, we will reach out to you and um, put together a little list and work together with Chief uh, Captain Hall um, to get those right along scheduled based on everybody's availability. So we will definitely follow up on that. Okay. Commissioner Pastorian. Hi, thank you. Um, gosh, you know, everybody has said so many different things and all of which I completely agree with and echo um, wholeheartedly. But uh, I do want to commend you, first of all, um, on your ability to handle the increase in calls that have happened over this last year. Um, that's a huge undertaking. And I am sure it has kept everybody very, very busy. Um, but but absolutely wonderful job in doing that and managing our safety along with that. Uh, you brought up some really key things. I, I have to say you have been incredibly transparent uh, and uh, wholeheartedly honest. Um, 
And, and I appreciate that, especially when it comes to perception and what that means, especially how you can compare that with reality and how um, those two things, they kind of go hand in hand and trying to close that gap where the perception is the reality is so crucial right now. And, and you're doing a great job by, by entertaining the dialogue that we're having tonight, certainly, but also offering to have that dialogue with everybody in the community. Um, that's not something you get from, you know, uh, officers all the time. And so t we're very fortunate to have you in this city um, to do that for us. And so I'm, I'm certainly absolutely grateful for that. Um, everybody knows I'm gonna latch on to the special needs stuff and I, and I absolutely am. I'm curious when, other than the fact that your awareness to that and your sensitivity to all of that and what you're doing with that is fantastic. And I'd love to help in any way um, as you start to figure out how you're going to gather those names and get them into a registry, please feel free to, to call or reach out to me as well because I will do whatever I can in my capacity to help you to get that um, off the ground and, and moving forward. But I am curious in terms of your training because you did talk about a lot of different um, diverse trainings that you have. Is there a portion of that training that specifically talks about how to handle calls or uh, how to interact with those, uh, whether they be younger or old citizens who are special needs? And what does that training look like? Well, okay, so we have uh, lots. Uh, okay, so there's basic training that covers uh, the response to calls like that, right? Uh, and then we have, I think it's a, it's a three-day standalone mandated class for all field employees called crisis intervention training. And that is, is a class specifically designed to dealing with people that are suffering through a mental health crisis. And that officer intervention portion, uh, it talks about tactics, it talks about strategy, it talks about communication. They bring in a board of people that suffer uh, through acute psychotic episodes, mental health issues, special needs. They put a panel together, officers and deputies Q and A them. Uh, we provide it to everybody in the region and all uh, deputies must go through that uh, as a part of their advanced officer training. Uh, there are a couple other standalone classes. For example, tomorrow morning at uh, Temecula City Hall, a guy named Brian Harriet, who runs an autism awareness training for law enforcement, is putting on another class down there that we're sending deputies to. I know I had lunch with a couple other commanders today. They're sending deputies from their station, and it's geared towards just autism awareness. What is high functioning? What is low functioning? When they elope, where do they go? How are they going to go there? How, what do they normally do? What do you need to know? Calming words, exciting words. Uh, should you take a safety article with you from the house, right? All these things like, because I don't know anything about, I mean, I do now because I've been through all these trainings, but before I didn't know my first 10 years on the job, I don't even know if I heard the word autism. Like I didn't know what it meant, but now I do. And I've, I've been the incident commander on many searches for autistic children where we have we have met as a command staff and said hey we got to start doing things different because we have a certain amount of time where we have to get to these children or these people that suffer from these issues before something bad happens to before they end up in the lake or end up drowning in a pool because they're drawn to water or they go to the traffic or or they're victimized right and so we've really done a, an enormous amount of work in this space to ensure that we have an appropriate response to these residents who live in our community, right? Not only for them, but for their families, because the families are not in a good spot to assist us when their loved one goes missing, right? Uh, they're, they're in a bad spot. And so we have to be the ones who have a very uh, detailed protocol and uh, you know robust response to those. So there's, uh, I'd have to get you the list of training, but I can tell you there's, there's, you know, the autism awareness training, there's the critical incident training. Uh, and here's another thing with these classes, they've changed names over the years, right? Like when I first went to the CIT class, it wasn't called CIT, it was called something else. So if I like look at my training record, I could be like, oh, hey, I did this one for 24 hours. I did this one for 96 hours. And they're all kind of the same thing, but as the industry evolves, the training gets better. Like I said, you know, 10, 20 years ago, I was going to like mental health disturbance classes 
but it wasn't to the level that it is now. They surely weren't bringing in a panel of people that had these specific issues and saying, they're telling us, and this is what we're talking about, where they would say, hey, deputy, when you come over, this is what I think is going to happen. This is what I'm worried about. And the deputy's going, well, this is what I'm worried about. And they're like, well, if you do this, that won't happen. The deputy's like, well, if you did this, this won't happen. They're like, oh, I didn't know. And we get in this dialogue, and then all those deputies that leave that class leave with a much higher level of understanding and empathy and strategy for dealing with these things. Because they can go in with a few tools that they learn from that class and immediately de-escalate these situations, right? Because they understand, or they just don't come into the situation the same way, right? They, they, they go to maybe a family member first, so they go, hey, what, what's going on? Oh, it's high functioning autism. Well, what does, what is, does he like sports? Does she like sports? You know, uh, maybe with our reoccurring eloping autistic family members, we work with the family to get them into an I love watch, right? Or we put a tracker in their favorite pair of shoes because you know they may take a watch off, but they're always going to take that same pair of shoes when they go, or they're going to take that toy. So we put the tracker in the toy. And, and so it's tactics like that that have really uh, enhanced our ability uh, to provide good service to our customers. And at the end of the day, right, like, like we want to provide good service. We're in the customer service industry, right? But really, I mean, we're here to help people. It's what we all signed on to do. All our deputies want those tools too because they don't want to be the one standing there going, hey, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. Or we don't want our deputies feeling like a failure. Or, you know, God forbid something bad happens to one of these children because we were inadequate or we didn't know how to do our jobs or we didn't have the most cutting edge tool or education to help save this child before they got run over on the freeway. Like that's mentally damaging for the employees. It's hard, obviously hard on the families, the poor child's dead. And then we feel like failures, right? So we have a, an innate desire to ensure that our employees have the best training and tools and tactics possible to have the best outcome in these situations. It is literally the best outcome for everybody, right? Like you succeed, we succeed, we succeed, you succeed. I mean, that's really what we're, it's all of us in this together. No, I absolutely appreciate that. And, and it warms my heart to know that you are, are doing these trainings, but you're doing very specific trainings. And that is, uh, I think, key as well when we're dealing with different types of scenarios is having very specific training that you can rely on, you know, to, to go back to, uh, to, to, to pull out as a resource. Um, in that same vein, you know, the, the, the scope of special needs and or disabilities is huge, right? Um, especially as we look at it from um, our youth perspective, and, and you brought that up a couple of times in terms of our youth within the community and such. And I'm just curious, um, you hit on resource officers, and that's a, a key thing, uh, something that I gravitate towards too as well. Um, being in a school environment all of the time and dealing with education. And I'm, and I'm curious as to what some of the proactive versus reactive methodology is being used with your school resource officers as well um, to, to help kids with, with special needs or, or outside of that. What, what types of relationships are being built there, um, you know, in terms of, of moving forward. And, and again, one of those things, having such a big, um, I don't know, like, I want to call it a spectrum, but but not specifically towards autism, just simply the special needs spectrum as it is. Uh, obviously, it covers ADHD, and we, we know that um, those kids sometimes will continue to grow and, and tend to have gravitate towards self-medicating, which leads to drug abuse and such. And it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation, and I've seen it happen multiple times. Uh, it's something that's very close to my heart as well. And I'm just curious how those things are being established so that we can try to be preventive in, in that manner. So, oh, I can tell you, so school resource officers, right? That, that's a very unique uh, selection within, you know, our organization, right? It takes a, a very unique deputy sheriff and uh, to get into that job and do a good job. We spend a significant amount of time uh, making sure that SRO is designed and has the aptitude and the desire to do that job, right? And their main job is to go in there and build rapport, 
build rapport with their children, build rapport with the counselors, uh, and to set that kind of lasting relationship between our community and law enforcement. And, and really that's, that's their main thing. Uh, as far as, and like, oh, we had a school resource officer here that said, hey, we're having a problem with runaways and resources for the family. So they just created this trifold. We put it out to SAFE, SAFE's gonna distribute it. We're gonna have it printed. We're gonna have it pushed out to all the commanders. We're gonna put it on social media. And it talks about families and what they can do for their runaway children who are looking to run away or have run away and been recovered. But that's what that SRO dynamic is to go out there and go, well, what? where's a where's a need that needs to be uh, handled? To, to, what do I need to do something here? Bless you. So what, what are we going to do? And that's what they're, they're kind of that front line, right? The, the kids are impressionable and they, they want to know, hey, what's this police thing thing about? Are you cool? Yeah, I'm cool. You know, we see videos of playing basketball with them, going to assemblies, they go into their classrooms, they handle some of the minor discipline issues that necessarily turn into criminal violations, you know, that kind of thing. And so their whole job really is to build rapport and we want the students and they know this, to want to go to them and say, hey, I'm having this problem. Can you help me? And their job is to say, yes, yes, I can. And then get them the help they need. On another thing that I remember, and I forgot to tell you, our deputies carry these cards for special needs. And if they run into somebody's special needs, they can hand them this card. And the card basically says, how would you like me to communicate with you? And it, it's like sign language. Would you like me to write it down? you know, that kind of thing. So we can bridge that gap because not all of us communicate the same way. Not all of us are comfortable communicating the same way. Some of us, when we get uncomfortable, we communicate differently. It's like adult relationships to uh, an unimaginable degree. And then with our special needs community, we have the ability either through translation, sign language, things like that, to use the tablet, take the tablet out of our car and I can talk and there will be a live translator there that translates into ASL or into a different language. And so we're breaking down those barriers for not only our special needs community, but people in our community that may necessarily not know English or Spanish or Haitian or you know uh, whatever, whatever the dialect is that our deputy doesn't know. We have the ability to break out the tablet right there and do immediate uh, translation services, either into, like I said, ASL or a different language. I'm, I'm, again, just amazed at what it is that you're doing and how you're utilizing your tools and, and everything to, to, again, like you said, break down these barriers. It's fantastic. Um, my last question, um, other than commending you on such an amazing <laughs> thorough uh, presentation, is really about um, your your youth explorer program um that's something that's very close to me as well you may or may not know i'm very much involved in scouting and that is part of our learning for life module and so whatever you know it, are those resource officers also being used as recruiting for you in your explorer post as well and and if so you know how's that going if there's anything that you know again you need help with um i can certainly put you in contact with the right people um but making sure that I think bridging that gap and creating positive um, pathways for our youth is so important for so many different reasons. Um, and even if you, you know, again, taking somebody who might be in the special needs community uh, and putting them in an explore program, it's not out of the realm necessarily. And I think that's something that, you know, should be talked about as well, because that program for learning for life is meant to not just, hopefully it leads to being a deputy or, or becoming a sheriff or whatever, but it's, but it's also not, it creates a, a structure and there's so many life lessons that can come from that. Um, I'm just curious how that's going for you here locally. Uh, very, very well. Uh, unfortunately, currently uh, there's not a whole lot of people jumping at this law enforcement job. Right now is a bad recruitment time. Uh, that being said, the SRO and the Explorer Advisor are almost always the same people, right? Because that's the kind of guy or gal they are. Uh, we currently have folks that have handicaps or have special needs that are part of the Explorer program. And uh, from time to time, not all Explorers become cops, right? I mean, as you know, uh, 
and some some go in the military, some go into other professions, just like you know uh, people that are in scouting, they go into whatever profession they're going to go into. Uh, we have hired uh, not only special needs, handicapped, but uh, people that aren't from the Explore program into our ranks. Thank you so much. Your presentation, again, has been enlightening, really, I think, for all of us. Um, there's just so much information that you've been able to provide and, and you know, dispel different myths as well that are out there about, you know, Riverside and the Sheriff's Department. So you've done a, such a fantastic job. Um, you absolutely make me certainly and my family feel safe. And, and I appreciate you and what it is that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I guess that leaves me. I will be very quick because you guys have done a really thorough job. Um, I want to thank you for your presentation as well. I would like to just cycle back around about working with um, communities of color and what we can do to provide programming. It's a, um, well, the first, my first question is, what was the process that you took to get the other programs established? What did you need? What did you need from the community? How can we help you? Because clearly this is something we all think is a gap to engage specifically and directly um, minorities, especially kids, youth. And so what can we do to help you? How did you start the other um, programs that you have? And well, that, and that's the, that's the beauty of our organization right now under uh, Sheriff Bianco, right? Uh, when it, community outreach, sky's the limit. I don't need the authority, the authorization, the permission, or anything to do anything community out, outreach related. Uh, what do you want to do? I'll tell you, we'll do it. Well, actually, I do have lots of suggestions because my specialty is youth and families, actually. And I um, presented at a conference with um, police officers from LA and River, some, some participated from Riverside County as well. So you all may know about this program called It's Needed. And what it does is it allows minorities in particularly to engage with law enforcement. And some, I, I pulled up their program here so I can read you a little of what it says. It says communication skills with the emphasis of listening, reading, speaking and writing as it relates to law enforcement. I think that is just so important for us to get an understanding as minority communities on how to safely and effectively interface with law enforcement, as well as law enforcement learning to interface with us as a community. Um, I appreciate what you've done in Indian country. I do a lot of work in, in, in the Indian country as well. And it does my heart good to understand that you understand and care. And it is just so important for people to feel like they are heard and that they are seen. And so anything that we can do to, we are a small population compared to the overall population here. And to Commissioner Steve's point, um, in order for me to go and work with the native communities, I had to learn their customs. <laughs> I had to respect their sovereignty, as you said. I, I had to immerse myself. And one of the things we work on a lot is historical trauma. Well, if you don't know about historical trauma, you shouldn't be on, a, on any reservation, first of all, right? And so the same thing with us as minorities, there's just special things that we need people to understand about us. And just because you tell us as a white person, don't be afraid, that's not going to make us not afraid. Feeling like we have a voice and that we're being seen and our fears. I love what you said. I could just kiss you all. You all are the best officers ever. Do you hear me? Because I get that you understand. My God, you guys did a phenomenal job. People don't care what you do until they know how much you care. And to me, your presentation said that we have a caring police department here in Temecula. Thank you for that. And so I would just ask you, can we put a little of that care and attention to working with minority groups just so they can understand you and you can understand them, especially our children. Because I also work very closely within the school system. And a lot of the issues that our children are having 
um, stems from negative interactions in school, right? And so then what do we do? And that's why I think this program would be good because that program, when the kid, instead of going to juvie or getting in trouble, they immediately partner with a police officer to begin to get into the program to learn how to behave in the community, but also not to fear the police. I don't want my grandchildren to fear you. I want them to see you and smile and, and um, know that you're here for them. And I believe with all of my heart, especially in Temecula, I can't speak for everyone else. I can't speak for Riverside County. I can only speak for Temecula where I live as a black woman. I am grateful that I really do feel like I can tell my children and my grandchildren, here's a nice officer here to help you. And that just does my heart good. But we came on this commission to get ahead of the game, right? We don't have that problem yet. We don't have that severe problem like the major cities do. And so I'm looking for to take more of a proactive approach in uh, mitigating some of those things because um, you said here, if it's predictable, it's preventable. This is predictable based on what's going on with the country right now. So we can prevent a lot of things by being proactive. And so I would just ask for future conversations and ride-alongs and, and thank you so much. Thank you. And thank Sheriff Bianco for putting out those videos. I watched a video the other day and I was praying, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. And the police officer said, I'm not going to die out here today. I, I'm going home to my family because they were pinned down and they were being shot at. And that video went out and I'm like, my God, I could not do that. So I want you all to know that you all are in our prayers and in our gratitude for putting your lives on the, on the line for us. We appreciate you. And we thank you so much for your candor here today and the opportunity in, in your heart. I, I felt your heart. And so thank you both. Bless you both. And, and just may God keep you safe and bring you home every night to your families. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, that's thank very you. kind. Thank, thank you very much. much. You're welcome. All right, commissioners, thank you for your engagement and we will move on to public comments. Have a good evening, gentlemen. Well, your officers, have a good evening, officers. Good night, good night, thank you. Good night, thank you. Okay, so we do have 13 public comments tonight. They're all on non-agendized items. I'll go ahead and read the rules. A total of 30 minutes is provided for members of the public to address the Race, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Commission on items that appear on the consent calendar or a matter not listed on the agenda. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. For all business items on the agenda, each speaker is limited to five minutes. For this meeting, public comments may be submitted and read into the record pursuant to the important notice provided at the top of this agenda. The first public comment is from Jamie Ann Lopez. Hello, I'm appalled that the rant council member Jessica Alexander made comparing mask wearing to the flight of Rosa Parks. The mental gymnastics that is required to equate the inhumane treatment of blacks for hundreds of years to the temporary mask mandate is really astonishing. Her rant reeks of white privilege and I find her comments and beliefs to be insensitive and a way of, out of touch with reality. Please remove her of her duties. How does this person represent Temecula? She's another smear to our fine city. There should be no place for this level of ignorance in our city's government. Next, we have um, Summer Ferb. Thank you for taking the time to hear my concerns. My name is Summer Berg and I have been a resident of Temecula for over a decade. I would like to address the shocking, culturally insensitive remarks made by council member Jessica Alexander at the April city council meeting. To hear council member Alexander compare the mask mandate to the oppression of the black community and herself to Rosa Parks was out of line. It made me feel nauseated. This is especially sickening after I learned that Council member Alexander did not attend the diversity training workshop on April 6. Council member Alexander's own Facebook page tagline states, strengthening the heart of Temecula, protecting its values and traditions, unify, educate, serve. I do not see those words reflected in council member Alexander's actions and words. She chose not to educate herself at the workshop. She's choosing not to unify the city or the council by defying mask mandates. 
She should be setting an example for citizens, yet she is dividing the community by making tone deaf statements about racial icons. I urge the council and the city to take action. Please address this behavior with a public statement in support of unity and in support of the black community. And please demand the council member Alexander receive the diversity and equality training that she needs and has previously refused. I ask if you choose this to remain ignorant and closed minded on matters of racial equality and her own privilege that she resigned from office. Please stand up for the BIPOC community in Temecula. There's no place for this behavior here, period. Thank you for your time. Next, we have Allison Donahue Beggs. I am a Temecula resident of 23 years, and my husband and I have raised our two children in this community. My youngest is currently a sophomore at Great Oak High School. After hearing the remarks made by Jessica Alexander at the last city council meeting about mask wearing, I had to send in a comment. All I heard from this public servant was how mask wearing affects her. Not only was this extremely selfish and inappropriate to her seat and her job, she then compared herself to Rosa Parks for not wearing a mask. This should not go unaddressed as this is extremely offensive. I understand that Ms. Alexander failed to attend the equity and diversity training that all of the other council members attended. It appears she truly needs this training and should rectify this immediately and apologize for comparing herself to a civil rights icon. She, she should also apologize for her self-centered remarks that do nothing but harm to this community. To combat COVID and ensure no more deaths, no more debilitating illness, no more jobs and businesses lost, we have to be in this together. We need to follow the safety protocols to ensure we are not infecting each other. And one easy way to do this is to wear a mask. To say in a city council meeting that she is against mask wearing is just downright to this too dangerous. Jessica Alexander should resign unless she retracts her statement. Apologize for, for comparing herself to Rosa Parks. Attends a diversity and equity training and attends the Ready Commission meetings. Next is Frederick Ball. While I'm not a fan of Jessica A. Alexander's politics, like her views on reproductive rights or if COVID-19 is real. I feel she has stepped over the line in a recent council meeting comparing the need to wear a mask to civil rights activist Rosa Parks being forced into the back of the bus. For someone who is vehemently pro-life, you would think she would wear a mask, a face mask to We're losing Erica. Yes, she's frozen. Maybe for a good reason, but yeah. she should know that her recent actions are culturally insensitive and not and not the values we want in city leadership. Yeah. I would hope that you take action and call out this behavior. Maybe she should sit down with members of the BIPOC community as well as receive the diversity and equality training she missed. Thanks for your time. Erica. You were going Next, we have Gia Retta. Erica. I request that the Erica. members of the city council Erica. make a public statement denouncing the words of council member Jessica Alexander. Erica. You're going in and out, Erica, from that last one that you read. You froze for a little while. Can you hear us, Erica? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. And the last one that you read, you went out on. So I don't know if you want to read that again. Uh, uh, by Frederick Ball. We didn't even hear who that was. So sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you know if you heard Allison Donahue? I heard, you've read three or two. I read three four, of them. Four? Okay. So then to go back to three. Okay. So I've read... And that's just with Frederick Ball was my fourth one. So go back to Frederick Ball. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So um, I'll make sure I pop my head up to see if it goes out again. <laughs> okay. So this is Frederick Ball. While I'm not a fan of Jessica A. Alexander's politics, like her views on reproductive rights or if COVID-19 is real, I feel she has stepped over the line in a recent council meeting comparing the need to wear a mask to civil rights activist Rosa Parks.
being forced into the back of the bus for someone who is vehemently pro-life. You would think she would wear a face mask to protect others' lives. Corey Parker, political action chair for the Riverside NAACP said it best, not being treated as a human being or being treated as a second class citizen is totally different from a universal measure to protect lives. I understand that Alexander missed the recent diversity training city council meeting and it, be, it may be for a good reason, but she should know that her recent actions are culturally insensitive and not the values we want in city leadership. I would hope that you take action and call out this behavior. Maybe she should sit down with members of the BIPOC community as well as, re, as, as, well as receive the diversity and equality training she missed. Thank you for your time. Next one is uh, Gia Reva. I request that the members of the city council make a public statement denouncing the words of council member Jessica Alexander regarding her inappropriate and racially insensitive comment comparing mask wearing to parks. I also request she, she be required to attend the diversity and equality training workshop she previously missed on April 6, 2021. I was disappointed to hear comments by council member Jessica Alexander comparing the reasonable life-saving act of donating a face covering to the civil rights struggles of Rosa Parks. Her comments were insensitive and historically ill-informed. It is shockingly inappropriate to compare the task of showing the spread of deadly virus to the hateful institu institutionalized segregation enforced upon people of color in the Jim Crow South. Furthermore, if Ms. Alexander is going to invoke the spirit of Rosa Parks, she should at least understand the bus incident instead of making up her own version of history. Newsflash, Jessica, Rosa Parks did not demand to sit in the bus. She simply refused to give her seat in the colored section of the bus for a white man. Hate and intolerance has no place in Temecula. Denounce Ms. Alexander's comments and require her to attend training. The next one is Tanya Better Leary. The views expressed by City Councilor Jessica Alexander at the City Council meeting on April 13th were extremely misleading and hurtful. To compare a mass mandate to the racist laws of segregation is false equivalency. It's very simple. And please make sure Ms. Alexander is aware that she is comparing being discriminated against for something you can change with being something discriminated against for something you can't change. Ms. Alexander could change whether or not to put a mask on and move free, freely anywhere she may choose, where Rosa Parks could not change the color of her skin and could not take any action to change whether she was discriminated against or not. Please share this simple concept with all of Temecula Valley City leadership so that their false comparisons will end. They are only serving to damage and divide our community that must stop. Thank you for your consideration to this matter. Uh, next, we have Leanne Keir. Good evening, and thank you for taking the time to read this. My name is Leanne Keir, and I have been in Temecula, a Temecula resident for the last four years. Recently, I, recent, I recently learned about some abhorrent statements made at the April City Council meeting by Council Member Jessica Alexander. I am appalled and horrified that an elected official in my city would feel it is okay to compare herself to a civil rights icon like Rosa Parks. This is not acceptable. In no uncertain terms is the requirement for everyone to cover their face for public safety during a pandemic anywhere near the same as forcing black citizens to give up their seat on public transportation to a white citizen. For council member Alexander to make the connection to make that connection shows an unbelievable amount of privilege and ignorance. I have also learned recently that Council Member Alexander was the only member in the council that was absent at a workshop regarding race, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiative. This is again unacceptable. Temecula needs to be uplifting, supporting, and protecting its BIPOC community, not trivializing their struggles. I urge the council and the city to take action. Demand that Council Member Jessica, Council Member Alexander receive the training that she missed earlier this month or resign from office. I would also like to see a public statement from city leadership denouncing her words at the April council, me council meeting. Hate has no place in Temecula. Thank you for your time. This one might be more than three minutes, so I'm just gonna put a time on it. Okay. My name is Julia Canvas. I have been a Temecula resident since 1998. Equity 
for individuals in our community, as well as education and training for those in office in regards to inclusivity and diversity is of utmost importance. As a teacher, practicing and teaching equity is at the forefront of my life of my life and classroom. I would hope that practices of equity and inclusivity are intertwined in the decisions and actions of elected officials as well. Jessica Alexander has not been reflecting these values, which are held by not only myself, but also many individuals in this community. This has been shown in her unwillingness to participate in the diversity training city council meeting on April 6, the workshop regarding race, equity, diversity, and inclusion ready initiative which she framed as a punishment rather than an opportunity to grow as a human being. Her ignorance has been clearly highlighted by her recent comparison of her refusal to ask to the civil rights demonstrations by the iconic Rosa Parks. This is racially insensitive to the struggle of Rosa Parks and people in the BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color community who are still experiencing major racism and discrimination in our society today. Refusing to wear a mask puts others in danger who may be older, immunocompromised, etc. Wearing a mask shows empathy to others in our community, and the refusal to do so should not be the actions demonstrated by elected officials. Jessica Alexander has clearly shown ignorance, racial insensitivity, and a lack of empathy in her actions and statements. Alexander's Facebook tagline includes the words unify, educate, serve. Some of the some of my BIPOC friends have told me that she not only does not unify this community, but her actions actually makes the city feel unsafe for them, their families, and their friends. Elected officials should make the, pe should make the people in their city feel safe, not the opposite. She has only clearly shown that she is not willing to educate herself with her refusal to attend the ready trainings. She does not set the example or reflect the values of many of us that many of us want to see in Temecula city leadership. Her actions leave me wondering who is truly trying to serve? Who is she really trying to serve? We cannot allow elected officials to behave this way and ignore the struggle, trials, and tribulations of diverse voices in the community. I would like to see the city council address this abhorrent behavior from Jessica Alexander. I also greatly push for Jessica Alexander to sit down with members of the BIPOC community, receive the diversity and equity training she missed, or resign from office. Hate has no place in Temecula. Uh, next, we have Richard Candice. I generally have a lot of respect for the members of Temecula City Council. You are performing an essential and at times difficult job balancing various decisions regarding Temecula and the people who live there, live here. However, I feel compelled to write and express my disappointment and discontent with one counselor, Jessica Alexander. I'm appalled by Jessica Alexander's recent behavior and comments, Black Lives Matter, the murder of George Floyd and other members of the community have clearly indicated that we as a society need to take significant steps towards equity and fairness. Jessica's refusal to educate herself with equity, equity training is a strong indication of her need to attend such trainings. Further, her recent comments comparing her refusal to wear a face mask during a global pandemic to Rosa Parks is beyond insensitive. It is a sign of ignorance and a lack of understanding of racial equality and the struggles toward that equality. Has she and other people who refuse to protect all of us through a face mask suffered hundreds of years of mistreatment, hate, prejudice, discrimination, and struggled to correct these societal injustices? Clearly, this is a rhetorical question, but one that she needs to understand before she makes any other ugly and erroneous comments. Jessica Alexander's comments and behavior have clearly indicated that she is part of the problem we face today. I encourage her to be involved in extensive diversity and equity education with members of our diverse community. The Temecula City Council does not have room for anyone unwilling to work toward increased equity in our community. Next, we have Tammy Sims. I'm calling for the resignation of Jessica Alexander. I have been a resident of Temecula for 33 years and I'm also a former Navy ICU nurse. I am and I hope you are, I am and I hope you are as well, completely shocked and offended that Jessica, one of our city council members is comparing wearing a mask to protect the health of our community to that of Rosa Parks actions after being forced to submit to institutional racism. It has not even been a year since another one of our city council members, James Stewart, had to resign for making the comment. For making the comment, he did not believe there has ever been a good person of color killed by a police officer in Temecula. 
How is it possible we have not learned from that mistake? Yet here we are April 13th during a general meeting of the Temecula City Council. Jessica Alexander made the following statement. Look at Rosa Parks. She was accommodated in the back of the bus and she finally took a stand and moved to the front because she knew that wasn't lawful. So she took a stand. At what point in time do we? I'm getting pushed to the back of the bus. This is what I feel like. This is wrong on so many levels, but the two most obvious are as an ICU nurse, shame on any civic leader who refuses to follow the CDC guidelines of mask wearing in which to protect the public. We have now, we now, we have now had 572,000 people die from this disease and she is unwilling to wear a mask that might save someone's life. She is unfit to serve our community. She also needs to apologize for comparing herself to Rosa Parks, who is a civil rights icon and fought against institutional racism. I understand Ms. Alexander failed to attend the equity and diversity training that all other council members attended. It is very obvious that she needs this type of training much more than anyone. If she's unwilling to join her fellow council members, she needs to resign as she has shown she is not a team player. I would also like to point point out that Jessica Alexander advertised and promoted the January 6th insurrection 92 times on her Facebook page. Anyone who is part of, part of or promoted the insurrection does not deserve a seat on our city council. I know we are better than this. I urge you to consider and encourage Ms. Alexander to step down for the greater good of our community. Ms. Alexander does not have what it takes to be a representative of our community. And as a fellow veteran, I'm embarrassed by her words, her actions, and encourage her to do the right thing and resign. Thank you for your time. Uh, next, we have Eva Smith. Hers is um, lengthy, so I'm going to put the timer on. My name is Eva Smith. I'm, I'm a registered voter, retired wireless communications engineer, community volunteer, faithful voter, and proud resident of Temecula for over 23 years. Serving the city of Temecula is a great honor and should be revered as such. During the past two months, I've seen a lot of growth in our city's leadership through formation of the Ready Commission, a, di a diversity and, e and equity workshop, and to make the city council's open discussions on face masks, mandates, and best practices to keep our community safe. I commend you for having several transparent public discussions. However, during the last to make the city council meetings, city council member Jessica Alexander compared her disapproval for Riverside County health orders to civil rights icon Rosa Parks, and her remarks are problematic. As a concerned citizen, I demand, against, I demand action against council member Jessica Alexander for her culturally insensitive and tone deaf remarks, comparing her unwillingness to protect her colleagues from the spread of coronavirus by wearing a face mask to civil rights icon Rosa Parks segregation protests. I would also like to request a public statement on whether or not the city of Temecula has a social media policy for city council members. How does the city of Temecula protect itself from liability when events, messages, and content posted on social media platforms, blogs, new newsletters by the public officials is perceived as being made on behalf of the city of Temecula or organized by the city? What is the liability the city of Temecula has when city officials post, promote, and spread disinformation and misinformation where does the city of Temecula draw the line? As the wife, daughter, sister, and sister-in-law of, of military veterans who have proudly served our country in all branches of the armed forces, I also find it concerning that council member Jessica Alexander fails to follow country, state, and federal guidelines to protect our citizens, teachers, students, and first responders, especially since she is also a veteran. There's no comparison between Rosa Parks' refusal to give her seat on a bus to fight racial segregation on public transportation and council member Jessica Alexander's tone deaf statements. Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat was just the beginning of a 12 month boycott. After the segregation laws were made unlawful, black teens were beaten, shot, and churches were bombed. It also resulted in years of hardship for Rosa Parks as she received death threats, lost her job, her marriage, her home, and financially stability in the wake of the Montgomery boycotts. History teaches us that on that fateful day, it wasn't a planned protest. It was a day when she was burdened. She was burdened, pained, and angered by the details of Emmett Till's death and systemic racism, which failed to hold his 
his murderers accountable. It's shameful and disheartening that council member Jessica Alexander would compare her refusal to follow social distancing and face mask health orders to the pain, brutality, and injustice suffered by segregated Black Americans during the Jim Crow era. That's three minutes. <clears throat> Next, we have uh, Rainisha Day. My name is Renisha Day. I live, worked, and went to school in Temecula Valley. I'm also a member of the Temecula Unity. First of all, I would like to commend the four members of the city council that attended the diversity training on April 6th. Their actions let me and other residents of color know that Temecula is committed to knowing better, to knowing better, to do better. They have my thanks. My, my thanks. Once again, I am saddened to see Temecula on the news for utter nonsense. As I said during the Unity in the community event held last summer, Temecula has a reputation to people of color and it is not a positive one. I was appalled and angered to hear Councilwoman Jessica Alexander's incendiary remarks during April 13th meeting. Perhaps she skipped on the day they, they covered the civil rights movement in school, not unlike how she skipped the diversity training she clearly needs, but I would like to set a few things straight. Number one, as an elected official who prides herself on serving her constituents, Councilwoman Alexander certainly used the word I a lot, and I cannot, and I will not. The focus should be more on the nearly 5,000 Riverside County residents who lost their battles to COVID and the prevention of any more deaths, deaths not throwing a temper tantrum about wearing, having to wear a mask. Number two, no one likes wearing masks. You know what doesn't care about anyone's feelings about that, COVID-19. Number three, Rosa Parks never moved from the back of the bus to the front. She refused to give up her seat at the back of the bus to a white man. If you are going to co-opt a civil rights leader's defining moment in history to make painfully terrible to make a painfully terrible metaphor, at least do the research and get the story correct first. Speaking of number four, speaking of poorly planned uses of figurative language as an English teacher, I would also like to point out that a nationwide mandate to wear masks for the health of your fellow countrymen is in no way, shape, or form comparable to the dehumanization, subjugation, and oppression of an entire racial group, full stop. I am calling, a, calling on Councilwoman Alexander to apologize to the mem members of the community whom she hurt with her racially insensitive, insensitive remarks and commit to going to diversity training. If she is unwilling to do these things to make amends, then it is clear she has no place in public office and needs to resign. I hope she will take the positive road and decide to grow and be better. The last public comment is from Jillian Larson. My name is Jillian Larson and I have lived in Temecula for 20 years. I watched the August 11th city council meeting with interest as the ready commission slides were presented so Temecula could see in detail what the, this commission would be structured to accomplish. I reviewed it again on YouTube so I could send the link to people I thought might be interested. I watched the Ready Commission meetings on YouTube regularly to keep up with their progress. I applaud our city council for their forethought in creating this groundbreaking commission. It is very exciting that this commission is tasked with listening to our community to hear the needs of all of our citizens. Temecula has been doing a great job, including our aging population, special needs pro special needs groups, those with various religious choices, families with all ages of children, different cultures and races, lifestyle choices, and so much more in what has been created and offered in Temecula. There's always more than that that can be done to enhance the lives of all of our community, to ensure all of our needs are included in what Temecula has to offer. And that is what the Ready Commission will be doing, listening and presenting our ideas to the council and city for consideration. Thank you for your virtual opportunity to submit a public comment. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion to approve the action, um, the minutes from April 8th? I so move. May I have a second? Second. Eric, can you do the roll call, please? Yes. Well, I have um, a motion from Wilson and a second from Commissioner Faulkner. Uh, Chair Baker? Aye. Commissioner Faulkner? Aye. Commissioner Harris? Aye. Vice Chair Huerta? Aye. Commissioner Pastorian? Aye. Commissioner Steed? Aye. And Commissioner Wilson? 
Thank, Thank you. you. Motion carries. Um, may I have, well, now we're going to have a presentation on the city's work um, program and update of quality of master life, of the life master plan. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, I want to start by introducing myself. I'm Matt Peters. I work in the city's planning department, specifically the long range division. And the reason I'm here tonight is on April 27th, the city council approved a contract to update the quality of life master plan or QLMP. And as part of the process, I'm attending all the various commissions and board meetings to provide some um, details on the QLMP update, but also provide some context to where that fits into the overall general plan update. Did the slide advance for you? Yeah, okay. So a little background on this state law pertaining to general plans. A general plan is the city's blueprint for future growth and development and is required to contain nine elements and all cities are required to adopt a general plan. And California law requires the nine state mandated, mandated elements and those are land use, open space, conservation, housing, environmental justice, circulation, noise, air quality and safety. And these elements are important as they also relate to the quality of life master plan. So our current status on the general plan, the last update or last comprehensive update was in 2005, but the plan has been amended over the years to change land uses, reflect policy changes and to meet statutory requirements. And a couple of recent examples of amendments include the Altair specific plan and an affordable housing overlay or AHOZ to ex expedite the construction of affordable housing. Over the last few months, we've met with the general plan update subcommittee to discuss the process of an update and two key takeaways from our meetings and direction from the subcommittee include phase the update over time using grant money and update the quality of life master plan first and have it serve as the foundation for the general plan update. So the Quality of Life Master Plan, QLMP, is a broad level planning document that identifies the city's six core values. And you can see them on the screen in the different colored boxes. And they range from a healthy and livable city to an accountable and responsive city government. The idea is to update the QLMP through public input and later update the general plan elements and organize them under the core values as shown here. This will ensure consistency between the documents with the QLMP serving as the foundation and the organizing document. This is an illustration of our general plan update process. As you can see, several work tasks have been broken down into four phases. I have a slide for each phase, but what's important to note is that we are in phase one and moving to phase two with the QLMP update. Both phase one and phase two are 100% grant funded. And the entire process is expected to take five years. However, we're already over a year in, uh, we've been making progress through phase one. And in my estimation, I think we're just at over three years left in the process. So a slide for each of the phases, the housing and public safety elements are in progress. I mentioned the nine elements, those are two of the nine. Staff is working with DeNovo Consulting on both. And these two general plan elements will be going to the planning commission and then to the city council in late summer or early fall, as the state requires action on these two elements by October of 2021, so this fall. Uh, also in May of 2020, the city's traffic impact analysis guidelines were amended to measure vehicle miles traveled or VMT as opposed to level of service uh, for CEQA. And this was another state requirement and was necessary to do this before diving into a full general plan update. 
Phase two includes four work tasks. The QLMP is at the beginning of the process, and that process, process also includes a true north or a community survey. And the survey results will be presented to the, to the Blue Ribbon Committee to help inform their discussions and any recommendations. We're also working with Fair and Peers on a baseline evaluation of our circulation network. And that process looks at what's been built or what streets are on the ground versus what was planned in the circulation element. And that will help us prioritize future street connections to improve traffic flow around the city. We'll also be developing a complete streets document uh, to consider all modes of transportation in our street design, such as walking, biking, and transit. And then also we'll be doing some GIS or geographic information systems mapping to help us prepare with the general plan update. Phase three is our shortest phase, uh, anticipated to last about six months, but it's a strategic phase in that what we'll do is we'll complete an exercise where we reflect on the city's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges by asking ourselves several questions, but a few examples include, you know, what did we learn from the QLMP update? What did we learn from our baseline VMT evaluation? And are there any jurisdictions or organizations that we should work with in the future? We'll also establish a general plan advisory committee, and then we'll develop uh, an RFP or request for proposal and a consult consultant selection committee. And then finally, phase four, four excuse me, uh, includes the general plan update and EIR. So this four phase process, each phase builds on the next uh, in order to help us get to a successful co completion of the general plan update. It is a large undertaking. So with that, uh, this is the quality of life master plan process graphic. Hopefully you can see this on your screen okay. Um, this graphic is what we're using to help us organize and, and work through this process of the update. Uh, the red icons across the top represent Blue Ribbon Committee meetings, Commission and Council meetings. And then in the middle uh, represents our public participation efforts, which include stakeholder meetings, workshops, pop-up events, uh, uh, a website specific to the quality of life master plans, social media, and other public outreach. Mm -hmm. And then along the bottom, uh, we have key deliverables, milestones, and draft and final documents. And we an anticipate that this process will last just over a year. So with that, the general plan update sub subcommittee recommended the Blue Ribbon Committee contain one representative from each of the commissions and boards. And the general plan update subcommittee, or yeah, the general plan update subcommittee is made up of Mayor Edwards and Mayor Pro Tem Ron. And those appointed to the Blue Ribbon Committee from the different commissions and boards include Lene Turley Trail from the Planning Commission, Ross Jackson from the Old Town Local Review Board, David Maddox from the Public Traffic Safety Commission. Kathy Sizemore from Community Services Commission and Denise Wilson from the Ready Commission. And then furthermore, uh, similar to the original Blue Ribbon Committee, the subcommittee also recommended a diverse group of stakeholders representing a variety of interests. Um, and I won't read you the list, but you can see it is a very large group. Um, that will be represented on the Blue Ribbon Committee. And at this time, that concludes my presentation, a little shorter than the first, uh, but I will open it up to questions, comments, and suggestions. Thank you, Matt. Commissioner, Welcome. I see, well, we haven't, yes, okay. Um, who wants to jump in? Don't all speak at once. Commissioner Steve. Um, first of all, congratulations to our commissioner, Ms. Wilson. I'm so proud of you and happy for you that you're part of this um, Blue Ribbon Committee. Thank you for representing us. And um, the city of Temecula um, has a history of just 
planning ahead and getting things so right in so many different ways um, that I can't imagine the job that you have ahead of you, Matt, <laughs> but I can see you've already been working really, really hard. So I just wanted to say on behalf of your community that we appreciate you and all the hard work that you do. I think most of our community doesn't understand the amount of planning and thought that goes into not only running a city, but seeing what's coming ahead um, and planning for that. So I just wanted to say thank you for your, all your hard work. Thank you, that's much appreciated. Uh, Commissioner Harris. Hi, I just wanted to um, thank you for your presentation and also shine a light on this uh, Commissioner Wilson. Um, congratulations. Um, I know that you're going to be an excellent uh, spokesperson for our group here. So thank you so much. Um, I found uh, your presentation really interesting. With my job at the environmental law firm, I go through many cities general plans. Um, and they're really important for the foundation of a city um, and dictates basically how we grow, how we move forward. And I was really excited to see um, that we are going to um, start acknowledging environmental justice and we're gonna start inter uh, integrating more um, uh, climate change mitigation policy as we move forward and uh, you know adapt to um, the standards of the state. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what that looks like. Um, yeah, just keeping it very brief. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, yeah, let's see. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Matt. Uh, man, I'm, I don't want to be sitting in your shoes. But, <laughs> but that seems like a lot, a lot of work. But I mean, I read the last, uh, the uh, last uh, master plan that, that was uh, uploaded to the site. So a, a lot of good information there. Uh, and you know, just to see how you guys go about, and, and, you know, like they say, making the sauces, you know, the backstage of sitting down and trying to map this out and uh, the solid team you brought together, a diverse, and we talk about inclusion and diversity and equity you brought all the people to the table that you guys need to be there to be able to hash out a plan that uh, ensures that Temecula stays a city that uh, that people would feel like they belong uh, so uh, as you're going to be stepping out and, I, and, and I'm really interested to see how equity equity will be written into in this plan and how uh, Denise Wilson is already empowered and equipped and she is the right person for the job uh, so, uh, I mean, we chose the right person. I, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to see how that plays out, how that's written out, and uh, how we define that in the, in the master plan. And I think uh, that's a solid do document that leads the city forward. And great to see that it's going to be written in. It's going to be a program of record for our city. And, and that's how we'll be looking at things as we look at our processes and procedures and and how we uh, continue to move to Mecca forward to be the number one city in the universe and millennium. Uh, but uh, so, <laughs> so uh, thanks, Matt, for giving a brief, very good brief, and uh, uh, looking forward to see how this plays out. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chair Baker. Did you call on me? Just making sure. Thank you, Chair Baker. I'm sorry, I'm having technical uh, difficulties today. Um, thank you, Matt, for your presentation. And also congratulations to Commiss Commissioner Wilson. I know we'll be well represented, super excited. I'm echoing what um, Commissioner Faulkner stated. I am very excited that the equity core value has been added. I think that is super important for the community and it's just uh, it just shows that Temecula is moving in the right direction. Um, the only question I had was I know um, you you um, you had the phases and the um, the um, the little drawing the picture. Um, so um, do you have like an estimated time frame of when it'll come back to the commission for further discussion? So the process of updating the quality of life master plan is expected to take just about a year. And uh, we'll be working with the Blue Ribbon Committee and then we'll have staff liaisons to each of the commissions and boards. In addition to the appointees like Ms. Wilson, um, they'll be bringing information back to the various commissions and boards to 
report back, gather feedback, uh, ask questions, and then report back to the Blue Ribbon Committee. So there will be interaction and it's planned that way uh, so that there'll be interaction between the commissions and boards and then the Blue Ribbon Committee as well. So I don't know if it's gonna be monthly, uh, you know, every three months, what that'll be, but throughout the process, they will be reporting back. Awesome, thank you, I'm very excited, thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Pastore? Thank you, Chair Baker. Um, again, Matt, great presentation. Uh, certainly the gold standard for, for the city, which is amazing. Uh, that's a huge undertaking and, um, Patience, right? It's a lot of patience <laughs> because the goal is great and we, we really want to see it. We're excited to see it, but again, patience. And, and I think that's going to be a good thing in our favor because great things come with, with time. Um, so that'll be, that'll be huge. Uh, again, Ms. Wilson, great is, she's perfect to represent on that committee. Really excited to see that. And, and as Commissioner Howertha said as well, um, looking just forward to seeing how equity is built into that plan. It's going to be exciting and how that starts to kind of emerge and, and build itself out will be really um, phenomenal. And it's a great move for the city. So fantastic work. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, seeing that there is no one else, Matt, we wanna thank you and we want to congratulate our fellow commissioner, Wilson. Congratulations, my dear. I know that you will do an excellent job and represent us well. And I appreciate the fact that we are adding equity as well. That concludes my response. Thank you, Matt. Right. Have a good evening. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you so much. It this time, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, do you have anything else, Matt? Nope, that's it. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks all Good of evening. you. You're welcome. Okay, commissioners, we're going to go on to commissioners' reports. Who wants to have a report first? Okay, Commissioner Wortha, Commissioner Steed. What, what, should I close my eyes? Da -da -da. Do it again. No, I'm just wait. <laughs> do you want her to go, Amelda, or do you want to go? Oh, I, I just, <laughs> um, thank, thank you, um, Chair Baker. Um, I do have a couple of updates, and then um, I do have a couple of comments. Um, I just want to remind the community real quick um, about the awesome murals out at Sam Hicks Park. Um, I, if you haven't been out there, you can go on um, Temecula social media and check them out. I, I was able to see the uh, pandemic um, mural last month by Sabrina Flores. And right now there's the Japan Ch Children's Day mural, which um, represents a connection between Temecula and our sister city in Japan. Um, if you haven't seen it, it is amazing. Um, and I believe the um, artist, and correct me if I'm wrong, Director Joel, it's Lee Bucci and um, Amanda Lee, I believe. Yes. So great, um, great murals. And also, I just want to give a shout out to Temecula's Parks and Rec. Um, they did post an awesome um, short blurb on Cinco de Mayo and the history of it. And so I just really appreciated that. Again, I'm hoping that in the future once things open up and maybe next year we as a commission can partner with maybe community services commission or the community services department and do an event um, in celebration of that or a multicultural event so just something to keep on our radar and also a shout out to our youth advisory committee who did their completion celebration last uh i'm sorry youth advisory council who did the their completion celebration last week I know a couple of us commissioners were out there and it was just great talking to those students. Three of them are graduating, going to college, um, but the rest, I think there are like 15 or 17 of them. They will be serving again next, um, next year, it sounded like. So looking forward to collaborating with them more. They are very um, pro diversity and inclusion and very connected with the local community and the local government. So I'm really excited to talk to them more. Um, and then also um, just wanted to note that there is a Women's Leadership Summit through MMASC. You can go to MMASC.org, May 24th through 27th. 
Um, and I'm noting that because on May 27th, there is a session on understanding and addressing diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And ICMA is also having their inaugural um, racial equity, um, it's their equity summit, their first one ever that they've ever done, which is June 10th and June 11th. And that's at icma.org. And I will send that link to Director Joel to share. And then I wanted to note, uh, I think it was Commissioner Proctor that brought up um, the bus route. So we're talking about RTA at the last meeting or a couple meetings ago. And I just wanted to note real quick for the community, because I was on the um, Southwest Transportation Now meeting last month, and they did note there were changes to 11 routes. Um, I wanted to highlight two that were that directly impact Temecula. Um, Route 205 and 206 Temecula to Corona, they removed some trips due to um, decline in ridership. Um, and uh, also Route 208 Temecula to Riverside, that's um, discontinued temporarily due to um, a decrease in ridership. But there is, um, you can do some transferring of other routes to get there. You can go to riversidetransit.com. So I just wanted to note that for the community, if, if they weren't aware, there were a couple of, of uh, bus routes that were, um, that were changed. Um, and then lastly, I just want to, I wanted to take a moment to, um, to express my gratitude for the support the Ready Commission has received and the Ready Initiative, which includes the support from, from the city and community members. As we know, um, the issues of racism, social injustice and discrimination, they have been at the forefront of many communities. And I believe that only unity can um, bridge this divide. I strongly believe that through mutual respect for one another, education and open productive communication, we can strengthen our community and work together to make it the absolute best it can be. I know there have been some questions on the purpose of the Ready Commission. So I just wanted to highlight that the city's website notes that the Ready Commission reviews and makes recommendations on topics of diversity and inclusion, within city events, services, programs, policies, and enhanced community relations. In alignment with this, our goal is to ensure that everyone is thought of, included, and heard. And just to go into a bit more detail, uh, Resolution 2020-59, which was adopted August 25th of last year, states that the purpose of the Ready Commission is to build strong relationships around issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity within the city council, commission, staff, and community, learn about existing city events, services, and programs, and identify opportunities for further diversity and inclusion within the same, serve as ambassadors to educate the community about opportunities related to diversity and inclusion within city events, services, and programs, identify opportunities for enhanced communication with all residents, including those of various race, ethnic, gender, disability, religious, and or cultural backgrounds. Identify opportunities for improved outreach to all residents on various city efforts and initiatives. And evaluate policies brought to the commission for consideration with an equity lens and make recommendations. So with that, I continue to look forward to collaborating, having collective conversations, serving, and working with the community, commissioners, staff, and council, and providing more recommendations and outreach that will benefit our city as a whole. And I invite and encourage all to participate in our meetings and upcoming events and training so we can grow this initiative together. Because I do believe this is our initiative, it's just not the commission's initiative, it's the community's initiative. And so lastly, I do wanna note something I read from the National Academy of Public Administration. And this was part of their Management Matters uh, publication, which uh, they printed in honor of Public Service Week, which was last week. And it reads, in the face of unprecedented challenges this past year, America's dedicated public servants have risen to the moment, building strength, healing, and hope to their communities and to our nation. Our public servants are a living reminder that here in America, we take care of one another and leave no one behind. So I truly believe that this is what this commission is here for, to build and bring strength, heal, provide hope, and leave no one behind. Um, and it, I, that is my true belief. And I just wanna note that this initiative is in alignment with many other 
agencies that have implemented um, this type of initiative or initiative or in the process of implementing this initiative nationwide. It's not just regional, it's nationwide. And this is also in direct alignment with the president's signed executive order directing the whole of the federal government to advance equity and racial justice. And so again, I just wanna encourage all to participate in our meetings. Once we're able to come out to community events, I look forward to engaging with, um, with the community and hearing feedback and engaging in constructive dialogue. And also when we have training and, um, and workshops, inviting everybody that, that can attend to attend. And if you can't attend, maybe watch it at a later, a later time. I know right now um, the, training and, the trainings and um, workshops are not mandatory, they're not state mandated, but maybe in the future, um, there'll be an opportunity to relook at that as other agencies start um, implementing these types of training and workshops into their, um, into their processes and uh, regular practices. Um, and with that, I just wanted to note again that this is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month and to let um, people know that there is help out there. If they need help to please reach out. Also want to note that it is Military Appreciation Month. Um, so I do want to thank those who are serving or who have served. So uh, thank you, Commissioner Faulkner and your wife um, for, your, for your service. I'm not sure if other commissioners have served, but I do thank you. Uh, and I guess I should thank my husband as well, since he's active duty. Um, he's probably asleep right now, but I'll thank him as well. Um, and as Memorial Day approaches, let's uh, pause and remember the sacrifice of those who gave all. So that concludes my report. Thank you so much, Commissioner Steve. Thank you. Um, I had the honor of um, volunteering with the city for the senior meal distribution last Friday. And it was really fun and it was great to be around people that truly have a heart of gold. Our city does mm -hmm. so much that we don't even know that our community members don't even know. So I commend them for um, just having hearts of gold and making our seniors smile and the service that they're putting out there. Um, and in the summertime, they actually um, provide meals to um, children that need meals while school is out. So I look forward to volunteering um, at that time frame as well. Um, the last couple of weeks have been very frustrating and I've been really sad and I've gone through all the emotions <laughs> and I've written them all down and then I rehashed it and rehashed it and rehashed it. But this is what I came up with and I wanted to share it and I always try to go the positive route, um, but I feel like I need to get something off my chest. So I put this together. The words of our council members were that words truly matter. The ready commission to me means love, understanding, and hope. Loving each other is so important for any community to be able to work together and to achieve common goals. Understanding each other is key to being able to form solid relationships with our neighbors and friends. Hope is what we give our kids and future grandkids when they realize that even though we may be different, we all have a common goal to make this world a better place for everyone. Our world is evolving every day. We may not understand it, we may not even like it, but changes are inevitable. As a community, it is our responsibility to be open to educating ourselves and to listen to others so we can learn from each other. When we stop learning, our community suffers. Lastly, and most importantly, the last letter of READY, the I, stands for inclusion. And that means everyone in this community. We welcome all of you to join us on this journey. Let's grow and learn together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Harris, um, are you saying good job or are you saying you want to speak, Commissioner Harris? Which one was, was that? Okay, does anyone have their commission, commissioner pastor in? Thank you, Chair Baker. Um, first, I had the honor of sitting in on a, um, a webinar with regard to the color of law, which was fantastic. I don't know if anybody else saw it, but it was such an amazing um, 
just a great presentation done by the author. And, um, and I know many of you have the book and have read it and, and all of those things. If you uh, go back, it's recorded. I will send the link to Director Joel and she can send it out to everybody. You can go back and see it. But one of the um, key pieces in there is that there is a new book coming as well. So um, certainly something to look forward to as we start moving um, further into this space and, and learning more. This is something that's uh, pretty interesting. and. He, the author did a fantastic job of just really embracing um, all of the content that you would normally get in a book into a one hour, uh, you know, um, quick, I guess you can call it a quick interview. So it was fantastic. Um, additionally, much like my colleagues here um, that have already spoken, I, I feel a lot of the same feelings um, that uh, Commissioner Steed has said, as well as Commissioner Huerta. Um, and I just want to take that time here really quickly to say thank you to those people that have supported the commission. Uh, and specifically, I want to take a moment and acknowledge and celebrate the diversity of our beautiful city, Temecula. And our community is one that has passion and shows love and embraces the small town of feeling and being neighborly. And that's something that you just don't get in a lot of places. And, and we have it. Um, I think it's essential that we all remember that diversity encompasses so many things and that we are all different and it's within those differences that we find commonality amongst each other. We also find tolerance, acceptance, respect, consideration, sensitivity, compassion, strength, and love. And these are the values and characteristics that I can be proud of and embrace. And these are the values that I see in this commission here. And I'm pleased to represent this city through this commission and serve alongside people who I know also share those same values. As a commission, we don't hold the power to make changes, but we can make recommendations to the city council for the review and consideration. The lens that this commission sees our community through is not easy to look through at times, as we might see things that we don't like, but that's okay. And we know that and we embrace that actually because it's within these images and these spaces that life happens and that we become inspired motivated passionate and ready thank you thank you commissioner wilson yes thank you very much chair baker um i just wanted to say first of all hats off to our commissioners because we have um endured this, it has been a trying last couple of weeks. Um, and, and my heart is heavy too, because I, I get phone calls from people saying, what's going on in Temecula? And, and it's negative. And I've lived here for 15 years and I've never seen us in the media in such a negative way like this before. So I just want all of us to keep our heads up we're doing a fabulous job and this is what our city needs. They need to have a commission that we can all work together to make sure that we are all connected and that we are all on the same page. And I love that. And I just wanted to share this, um, 1 Corinthians 13 verses four and five. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it does not proud, it's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It does not easily anger. It keeps no record of wrongs. So moving forward, I just want us to be on a positive note and just be mindful of our peers. And then just pray that we can have a better week to come, a better commission, um, our next commissioner meeting, better city council meeting. We have a great diverse group of people in our city and we want to keep the main thing the focus and that's to be um, serving on our ready commission and to make sure that all of our community have a voice and that their voices are heard and we're not going to let anything um, steer us away from what our main focus is so i just want to applaud you guys all and let's just keep the focus what we came here to do and be um, a beacon of light to our city and to continue to do that God bless. And that's it. Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. You're welcome. Um, Commissioner Hoffman? Yes. Wow. Ooh. 
You guys said it all, man. I'll tell you, uh, great words, uh, way to wrap it all up. Uh, and I feel, I felt heavy over the last couple of months as well with things that have happened and, and trying to you know, target my words and what I'm going to say and how I'm going to, you know, uh, make a statement about that. Before I get to that, I wanted to share a couple of things with you. I, I was, I had a conversation with Oregon, a representative. Uh, I was in a, I was on a D, uh, DEI conference and, and, and a young lady from Oregon was starting up DEI, diversity, inclusion, equity in the state of, in, in state of Oregon. In a really rural area, and I mean, and she's a she's a young lady of color, uh, and she's uh, Asian and Asian and white, and she wants to take this big initiative on, and and the fight, the pushback, because you know, uh, she's in a space where there's not a lot of a lot of lot of a lot a lot of diversity. She's in an area where people have left. I felt like they didn't belong and actually left the city uh, because of what has come out of trying to trying to galvanize around diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and we had a long conversation and she was trying to pick my brain. I said, I'm doing it too. And we're, we're building this thing out too with some of the things that you're going through. Uh, uh, our, our, our demographics is a lot different. Uh, things are a lot more accepting down there. But she's struggling in a space where, you know, she, she really doesn't have support of leadership. And the people in the town uh, do not want to embrace it. Uh, so, and now we, now we come into where we are. I want to, I want to start with some good news first, the, the YAC, <laughs> the Youth Advisory Council. And I'm sorry, Chair Baker, please uh, apologize again 10,000 times because I tell you, I did not know it was your husband and the kids because nobody introduced them and we ain't talking, we started talking to kids. So please let them know, I, I'm going to circle back around and make that right. So that was, that was my fault. I was so engaged in the kids, I didn't really, introduce us. I saw my other fellow commissioners there, but I'm like, who is this guy with these kids? Are they joining the yak? Or I didn't know. I didn't know. So, but I had a chance to talk to all the kids and spend a lot of times talking to your, your chair, uh, chair Baker, your kids. And wow, you guys have done an amazing job. Those young, those three are, are smart, energetic, and they're ready to take over the world. And, and I know your oldest, she was like, I'm going to, I'm going to be a part of yak. And I was getting on her like, you need to join. You need to join. And she's like, I'm going to join this fall. I'm like, okay, got it. So, and the other kids talk, I asked them specifically a question about, do you know what ready means? Uh, you know what this commission, this commission is about. And every one of those kids, they defined what it was about. And they said it is needed. And these was, this was diverse group of kids. It's like, I support what this is about. And I think it's, it's needed. I mean, because it's about the diversity, inclusion, and making sure, and the, and the last thing that we don't put on ready is with all of that, making sure people belong. Uh, so, and again, we're here to create a, a, a Temecula where people feel like they belong. Uh, so I wanna say a couple of things. I wanna applaud city council for a unanimous vote uh, to come up with the ready commission. Let me say that first of all. Second of all, I wanna applaud city council for unanimously voting that they will attend ready re, real training to try to get understanding of uh, uh of this task ahead of them and to try to get under understand better what that means uh so i want to applaud them for that and lastly i want to say words matter i mean we are leaders now we're on this commission our words have got to be thought out uh that and 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 bounced off of people before we step out and make any comments on this platform, on a news platform or anything, how people really look over what you're about to say. Because words matter, and once they're out of your mouth, guess what? In this public forum, you cannot take them back. Uh, so I say that the last thing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read something I, I saw, a slide that I really think uh, hits on what we all talked about as well. And it says, highly inclusive leaders, and these are the six C's of inclusive leadership. Highly inclusive leaders are committed to diversity and inclu inclusion because their objectives align with their personal values. Highly inclusive leaders speak up and challenge the status quo and are willing to have difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Highly inclusive leaders are mindful of personal and organizational blind spots and self-regulate to help ensure fair play. Highly inclusive leaders have an open mindset and a desire to understand how others view 
and experience the world. Highly inclusive leaders are confident and effective in cross-cultural interactions. And last but not least, highly inclusive leaders empower individuals as well as create and leverage the thinking of diverse groups. So I wanna leave you with that and, uh, and let's, let's be those inclusive leaders that, that are identified and aligned with these six core values of leadership and, and how we step out because I think they're, they're powerful, they're impactful. And I think that's the way we should address, as, address things in our city to ensure that we make recommendations to our leadership uh, to ensure that Temecula is a city that's ready, but also a city where people belong. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, now I know you was going to have something to say, Commissioner Harris. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you all. Um, bear with me. Uh, I, I have a lot to share, which is a good thing. Our city is doing a lot and I'm putting my feet to the ground. I fractured my foot, but I was still out there and still meeting and speaking with everybody. <laughs> um, so I want to talk um, primarily about, uh, well, not primarily, but just shine a light on uh, my attendance at the Mary uh, Phillips Senior Meal Distribution. It was such a wonderful opportunity um, to see the work that is being done um, by our community services department. I also got to visit the community garden, which y'all know I was very excited about. It was extremely beautiful and well taken care of. You can tell that um, everyone who works and volunteers in that garden bring a part of themselves, they bring love and taking that food that they harvest and providing it to the seniors, wow, what a way to demonstrate that you truly care um, about the citizens of this town um, than to feed them. That's an amazing thing to do. Um, I got to work with Cassandra Ambriz, uh, Yvette Martinez, Cecilia Rodriguez, uh, Jordan Wilson, who is absolutely wonderful. Um, Chair, uh, sorry, Commissioner Wilson, you have raised a wonderful man. He was brilliant um, to speak with. Um, and Brittany Sayers, who um, recited such a profoundly moving poem um, to me and to the rest of the community services. Um, she really spoke her a true testimony to her, her experience as a black woman navigating navigating the world um it even it caused a couple of us to shed tears um and the fact that she was able to feel comfortable enough around her co-workers who really felt like her family to share these feelings really is just a testament as to the environment that we are creating within the city in our departments. And that's something that should be highlighted. Um, these are a group of individuals who are motivated by their passion to care for others and to make sure that this city is more inclusive. Uh, I did not get everyone's name, but everyone that I worked with was so absolutely moving. Um, I next wanted to shine a light on Beatrice and Fernando Diaz. They are the founders of a special needs uh, baseball league within Temecula that my, uh, that my nephew attends. They uh, created this league 11 years ago um, with the intent of creating a safe space uh, for special needs children and young adults where they could feel included and not discouraged. Um, the first year they started off with 12, um, 12 participants. Now they're up to 60, which they said is a little bit, a little bit less than usual because of COVID. Um, they, break, uh, they, they break the participants down into two groups. There's a younger group that is four through 13 and an older group that is 14. And there are some participants who are 22 years old. Um, 
they're connected with the Temecula Baseball League, which provides them the opportunity to um, give their participants uniforms and pictures for free, which is wonderful. Um, I spoke with them and they said that volunteers are always open and they are open to assist them and they always need it, um, particularly with coaching for the younger group of children. Um, and, and they also, um, when I had spoke with them, they had mentioned the possibility of kind of getting it out to the wider community, what they're doing um, in the uh, spring magazine. I think there's spring summer, uh, Temecula spring activities magazine. I think um, if I could just be connected with the way that I could share with them where they could reach out um, and get their information out there. So there's more families that will know this exists um, for my nephew Dayton, he's 12 years old. This was completely astounding and life-changing for him to be able to go out on that field and feel absolutely comfortable with um, his teammates and just go and play the game and not feel different. Um, shining a light on what it truly means to have a safe space um, for children. Uh, it's, it's extremely important. I also wanted to talk about um, the Youth Action um, Committee, YAC, and their completion ceremony. It was um, absolutely moving to be there. Those young adults, and I'll call them young adults and teens, are so inspiring um, in the work that they want to do with the city and what they've already accomplished in the programs that they've been supporting, whether it be mental health or, or self-care. Um, I discussed with them as well what they thought, you know, ready, ready meant and how they felt like the city could embody, embody race, equity, diversity, and inclusivity. And they brought up that they, they thought it would be a really outstanding idea to celebrate and acknowledge the diversity in our city with events that targeted them. So um, they had brought up cultural fairs, which um, I know Kevin Hawkins had mentioned that we had, but making them quite grand and larger, just large celebrations of, um, of diversity in our city, just shining a light on what provides so much, um, so much strength to all of us. Um, uh, I, I thought it was important because I grew up in uh, District 1, Matt Ron, and we had powwows and I would attend them when I, or I would attend them when I was quite young um, into, until I was older and moved away. And I thought that it was a wonderful, um, wonderful opportunity to learn about the indigenous culture uh, in our area. So if we could keep that going in that theme, it really, it really works to make our city a more inclusive place. Um, I also want to thank the city council for acknowledging Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, it's extremely important to destigmatize mental health um, and have open and honest conversations about mental health and link uh, individuals to treatment opportunities. Having these conversations can save lives. So um, I wanted to highlight that as well as AAPI Heritage Month and thank the city council um, for making the proclamation, um, highlighting the, the many contributions that the AAPI community um, has contributed not only to the country, but our, our, our community here. Um, in recognition of AAPI Month, I reread this wonderful book. Uh, it's titled America is in the Heart. It was written by Carlos Bulasan in the 1930s. It is, um, he was a Filipino farmer and immigrant to the United States. And he discusses his, um, the injustices and the prejudice, prejudices that he faced as a farm worker in California. However, through his struggle, he remained committed to uh, the promise of a better life. So I thought it was really important to open up this book again um, and really recenter myself, acknowledge that it wasn't until I attended college that I had the opportunity to learn about um, Asian American history first time. 
I, I, it's astounding. So um, I just wanted to bring that up and provide an opportunity for y'all to read this absolutely wonderful, amazing book. AAPI Heritage Month comes at a particularly important time when this country is seeing an astonishing rise in anti-Asian violence and hate crimes. These occurrences shine a light on how rhetoric and words matter. And they have grave and sometimes deadly consequences. Hyperbolic and incendiary, sweet, incendiary speech only work to pull this cord, the phrase of an already, of an already frayed fabric of our, of, of the already frayed fabric of our country. And much like our country, our city is divided right now. Although we should be using our differing opinions and views as, a per, as an important part of maintaining a healthy dialogue within the city, somehow we've lost that, that idea along the way, it seems. We have begun to rely heavily upon the ideas of, of simple good and bad. Things are either good or they're bad. Um, if your opinion doesn't match mine, you're bad. Um, if I don't have a personal connection or understanding of your hardship, it simply doesn't exist. We must take the time to learn from one another and acknowledge that we have strength in our diversity, not just the physical characteristics, but also our perspectives. And that's what makes the city great. How, however, in order to accomplish this unity that we desire, we must face some uncomfortable truths. And that is racism does exist, full stop. It exists within our own community. It's not a theoretical idea that exists and happens in cities far, far away. Um, it happens here. And if I could use my time with this platform in order to reach out to communities um, of color, of diverse groups of minorities, irregardless of their race, gender, disability, ability, religious background, then I would like to do that. And I believe that our city has taken concrete steps to give a voice to people who for so long felt voiceless. I have the unique perspective of having been raised since four, year, four years old in this city as a woman of color. I understand the complexity of racism and of discrimination at large. It doesn't just exist with race, it exists with ability. I have a nephew, as I've mentioned before, who I helped raise at the age of 16, who would come home crying because he was being bullied. Mm. These are real things happening every day and we can't continue and we are not continuing. And that's why we're all here to dis disavow people's voices. But I have hope, like many of the speeches that y'all gave today, there's real hope here. There's a real chance to move forward. And I, I see us, all of us trying our hardest. And I see the support that we got today in those comments and people believe in what we're doing. And I believe that we're taking the right steps forward. And um, I, always, I always love using quotes. So um, to move forward and in order to enact the change that we wanna see in this community, Martin Luther King said that we need to be love struck with one another, not simply to be colorblind. And I'll add, not only just to be tolerant, because really think about what tolerance is. What are some of the things that we tolerate? We tolerate crying children. You don't tolerate 
other human beings and their cultures and their perspectives. We need to be love struck with one another because that shows that we care and that we have deep compassion and that we are concerned for each and every individual in our community. So um, before I keep babbling on, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you all for providing me this platform and being amazing colleagues. And thank you all, you know, in the city who uh, provided me this opportunity as well as all of us to represent them and move our city forward. Oh, well, I guess it's my turn to speak. <laughs> Lord Jesus today. Sure, Baker, I'm sorry, can I just add one thing? Um, because Ivy did mention the proclamation that city council did, which was amazing for national Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander um, Heritage Month. And I just wanna get this out to the community because I did attend an awesome um, webinar titled Addressing Hate Crimes, which focused on stopping AAPI hate, which had a great panel, by the way, including Director Joel, but I wanted to note that they did note a website, fightasianhate.org, that has a ton of uh, resources and you can go there to see what policies are happening as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there for the community. Thank you. And I too went to the um, um, training that, well, she was a panel and she represented, this would be you, Randy, you represented us very well. And I appreciate the fact that you are out in the community, you know, it's, it does good for us as Temeculans to know we have a city representative on such platforms. So good job for you. Good job. Good job. We really appreciate it. You know, I've just really had conflicting thoughts myself as well. You know, I'm a little bit more feisty than you all here. You all a little bit more tame. I'm not. So like you, Jackie, I don't wrote, I don't pray. I don't say a few cuss words and I don't even curse. Um, <laughs> and I have been like, Lord, what do you want me to say in this seat, in this space? And ultimately, I will start off by saying, I feel that as a Christian, as a chaplain, as a ordained minister that has spent several years in several Bible schools, and the fact that I have only served this community spiritually first and foremost, I was a chaplain at Inland Valley and Rancho Community Hospital from 2002 to 2014. I immediately became to this community as a servant. And I was a servant of everyone, different religious beliefs and backgrounds, everything you want to name, I serve the people because I love Jesus. And he said that people will know that we are his by the love that we have one for another. It baffles me how in the name of Jesus, we can hurt other people. We can marginalize other people. I don't know what Bible we read, but this is what I would say. Back in the day, you all remember that term? What did Jesus do? They had bracelets and everything else. Well, my philosophy is, well, what did he do? Can we talk about what did he do since we're using faith in this arena because no one's addressed that a lot of people here, we're a very religious community. That's very different than having a relationship that leads you. We use our faith as a, a badge to oppress that we cannot do. One thing I know about all faiths is where we intersect is in our humanity. In our humanity, in our care for one another. And I haven't seen care. I haven't seen care. That's what bothers me here. Because when you can't see me as a person, and you dehumanize me because of the color of my skin or because of my socioeconomic background, my sexual orientation, my disability, my gender, my whatever. You may not like the glasses that I have on, 
But when you do that in the name of the Lord, I must speak up. I, I must speak up because it, it's not the God that I represent. The God that I represent loves everyone on this Zoom and everyone in our community. Everyone. Jesus said, my house will be a house of many nations. Many nations. Do we know that God has called us to serve many nations and come together as many nations? This is why I keep asking you to pray. This is why I keep calling for prayer for this city, because I am concerned that we are losing our way. We are losing our way. And if we don't speak up and say, enough is enough. I told the police the honest thing tonight. I do feel safe here, or at least I did until all of this foolishness, because that's what I call it. You know, you all have your, your fancy terms for it. I just call it foolishness. At the end of the day, if I was raising a child, and I'll just break it down, because, you know, we're going to make it as simple as a child. And as a child, the child offends, hurts, or hits another child, what is the first thing we tell them to do? Say, I'm sorry. Come on now. It, it doesn't, you know, we, we can't act like we're just going to go on in sin, and that wasn't my intent, and that's not my heart. And, and the things that I'm saying, but where's the accountability? Because even as Christians, Christians, the scripture says, if you've offended your brother, leave your gift at the altar and go back and make it right. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation and repairs of the breach. I am calling us to rise to our better selves, to our better selves because this is not Temecula. This is not the Temecula I love. This is not the Temecula that I stood up as a black woman and said, I willfully will serve. We are serving at the pleasure of the council. We are not here to push our ideas upon anyone. We are not here to do anything except what we were asked to do. Let's be clear about that. that, that I don't like that either. Let's make sure we have things clear. The Ready Commission has no authority to enact anything in your life except a suggestion. And that's it. That's it. We look to our leaders in our city council to enact legislation that affects our lives as a city. And I would ask my city council to make training mandatory and this is the reason why because I have spent my life you all know me for youth and kids but what I have done is spent my entire life and career building a bridge through understanding through understanding and you can't understand my struggle if you're not willing to hear my past my process what I've been through how I've hurt how my children are afraid. I have not experienced most things as most minorities have because I've been an entrepreneur. I haven't worked in the workplace since 1998. So even as a black person, a lot of things I have not experienced that other blacks have experienced. So I wanna give voice to them and not say, my, exp my experience represents all Black experience. I don't want to be responsible for that either. We need to stop doing that because we get a token Black. And then a token Black speaks for all of the Blacks. And because a token Black said that we don't have a problem, then we don't have a problem. That doesn't work either. I can only speak to my experience, but we're here to give everyone a voice, to be heard, to be seen, to be valued. And so I would just ask, can we create a space where we can learn? Because even for the words that were spoken, it was out of lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. It, I don't think that it was malicious, but it was harmful. And I want to give you a difference between intentional hurt and harm. 
If you go to the dentist, guess what he does? To get your teeth pulled, it hurts. But if you don't get your teeth pulled, it's going to cause harm. Learning about others may hurt you for a moment. In other words, I'm inconvenienced. I don't want to know about Asian Americans. Because see, we're talking about Rosa Parks and, you know, good, let's talk about Rosa Parks. But when I look at the news and see my Asian Pacific Islanders, the elderly being beat because someone's calling the coronavirus a China virus, that's reckless. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. And do you want to know why it's dangerous? Because of our children. Yesterday, I saw on the news that another Asian gentleman was beat. And guess who was with him? The perpetrator, an 11-year-old. An 11-year-old. Our children are watching us. The black kids, the white kids, the Asian kids, the mixed kids, the special needs kids. And if I miss one, you too. They're watching us and they need us to do better. I'm calling us to do better together. I'm here, I'm available to talk. We need to talk. We need to talk some things through. We need to get a baseline of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable as a city, I believe. Because it's not a matter of opinion. If I started saying things about Randy's race or her religion, everyone be appalled. We, we, we need to be appalled. The behavior is appalling. But it can be repaired. So can we start repairing? Can we have meetings to repair? Can we pray? Can we pray for each other to have understanding? Can we pray for our, arts, our hearts to open up? And if we say we Christians, can we pray that God breaks our hearts with the things that break his heart? And people are on God's mind. That's what God is about. God so loved, he gave his only begotten son. He so loved us. I need to see love, especially we said in the name of Christianity, can I see some love? Can, can a sister get some love? Can a sister give some love? Because I'm here to give some love. And I'll get off of my soapbox because that's all I really have to say. I just, I just, could, I just couldn't, couldn't sit back in the name of the Lord and say we're doing right because I think we have a lot of error, religious error going on here because you cannot tell me the God we serve says to hurt people, marginalize people, discredit people, throw people away, hurt. That, that's the, the, I don't know what kind of Christianity we talking about here, but that ain't the God that I know. And I think I can speak to us since that's what I've given most of my life here in this community doing, serving people's spiritual needs of all faiths, of all backgrounds. And I will ask that our city leadership do just that lead together, knowing that we all need you. We all need you and we all need our, your voice to stand up and say, right is right, wrong is wrong. We need to determine some, some boundaries here. I, I also wanna say that it is mental. I went to the equity summit this, this month. So thank you all for hearing me that. I know I made the win a long time, but I was having a lot of emotions and trying to calm down and trying to talk. And it's just a lot. And that's also, the mayor said something that I want to echo. Can we release grace? Can we have some grace? Everybody needs grace. Everybody, including the Black people that's being compared to for sitting in the back of the bus for mass. This is ridiculous. Can we have some grace and mercy for the people? I understand people are frustrated, but you don't understand what it is to be Black. You never will understand what it is to be Black. And when we're out of these masks in a couple of months, then I can't change my Blackness. There is no comparison. We need to understand those things. I'm going to go. I'm going to move on. Y'all, I'm, I'm going to move on. It's so much to say. It just pissing me off. I just need y'all to know that. I just need to be real. Look, people, look, people. <sighs> Jesus helped me today. 
I went to this equity summit. I'm trying to move on, but the more I think about things, the more it just makes me concerned here. Okay, but I went to this equity summit. I told you all I was going to. And what was so powerful about the equity summit is not because they taught on equity. Everybody's teaching on equity now. It's because they actually modeled it. <laughs> and we were in the summit when the George Floyd um, verdict was read. They stopped the conference and read the verdict. And people from all races and backgrounds weeped. And they all weep for different reasons. But the fact that I will be a part of something so great in community action says that I know that I am the right person in this time for Temecula. Because when we can feel each other's pain, each other's pain, when we are touched with the, um, the burdens of our brother, when we lift up each other, when we mourn with those that mourn, you all are fighting over masks and people died here. And how many flags do we have going around on that duck pond for those families? I wanna speak on that as well. I want us to think about the families that lost their loved ones in our town to coronavirus. Put your debate down and see the people. What about those families? My husband caught coronavirus and we didn't even know. And I thank God he's still here and I'm gonna wear my mask and on the 18th, I'll be fully vaccinated and I still will have my mask on in respect of those that need me to wear it. I can, I can suffer a little bit. I can sacrifice a little bit. You know, I'm cute. I need you to see all of my face but I also need you to be safe. I know y'all want me to stop. Stop, stop pulling on me. But I'm just saying, it's just, just can, we, can we see each other as human? Do you see my face? I'm human. I'm human. Can you see my face? I'm human. You all have lost touch with humanity with some of these debates. That's what bothers me here. People are hurting in this town. People are afraid in this town. People need their leaders to speak up and their community to come together. And I commend everyone that's spoken up, whether you wrote in, however you use your voice, thank you. Thank you for using your voice. And lastly, I would say that it is Mental Health Awareness Month and we are providing, thanks to the city of Temecula, we are providing one 90 minute consultations with a mental health professional for this month for free. You have to be a resident of Temecula. That's, that's what our agreement is here, but you will be met with a mental health professional and they will give you a risk to resilience assessment with you. Our only caveat is that you have a child and you'll get a strength-based um, profile of your family and if there are some areas in which we see that you need some additional services, either we will put you in touch with service providers that we've partnered with, or we have in-house services to help you. But at this time, it's just so much important to have mental wellness. It's just not mental illness, but mental wellness and the level of pressure people are going through. They need someone to talk to. So if you need some resources, you can reach out to my staff at the Empowerment Center and we will provide um, a, 90, a free 90 minute consultation intake conversation with a mental health professional free of charge for you and your family. Randy, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sorry, but I'm sorry because I don't went on. I feel like I don't went long. But, and lastly, commissioners, thank you for your courage to die here because everyone's watching and scrutinizing everything you say. So I'm sure you want to say it right and be perfect and so do I, but I just burnt my boat. Right is right and wrong is wrong for me, Randy. So, um, commissioners, you just, you make me, 
you lift my spirit and you make me want to work more for you and more for the community and more for our council. Um, so thank you for that. Just thank you for representing the community. Um, so I will um, keep my comments super short. I'll just focus on in on, um, we are wrapping up our internal presentations for the commission. Um, and as we're doing that, we're starting to also align with phase two, which uh, of our ready initiative, uh, which is uh, outward focusing, as you all know, which is also aligning with when the state is starting to open back up from COVID and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, the next couple of meetings at the ready commission, we will go ahead and begin to work on our draft equity value that we will be sending forward to the Blue Ribbon Committee. Um, and I'm looking forward, Commissioner Wilson, to being present in those rooms with you as well. Um, and then obviously lifting up the voice of this commission and, and your representative community as well. So we anticipate at the next meeting in June, uh, we will ha start having that discussion about what a draft equity value could look like as your business item. And then in July or August, you will end up adopting your collective recommendation for the equity value to forward to the BRC and then eventually council for adoption. So that's what's going on in that uh, space. And our external presentations, um, we have several folks, as we've discussed, in the community that are also in the equity space, um, starting to work in the equity space. As Chair Baker said, everyone is in the equity space now. So, um, and, and some were in the equity space and didn't know that they were in the equity space and now are realizing they're in the equity space. So, yeah, so we'll good. start to go ahead and have external presentations uh, from the chamber, from MSJC, from the school district, from Rancho Church, from uh, and just really continue to build that synergy um, and start to really build out that stakeholder uh, list and so on and so forth and, and, and make sure that our work is aligning. Um, and the very last thing I want to say is um, thank you for acknowledging um, uh, staff and uh, city council um, specifically in this ready initiative. Last summer, the city council did unanimously approve the ready initiative. This commission is one piece of phase one of that initiative. Um, so we still have a lot of work to do, you know, um, uh, in this space, but no one does this alone. No one does this alone. And, um, we, don't, we do it with city council, we do it with staff, we do it with community members, we do it with commissions. Um, and, and for me, I don't do this work without you and city council and my boss, city manager, Aaron Adams. And I don't do this work without Erica Ramirez either, who is on um, all of our commission meetings. Um, every single one of us needs that, um, that, that capacity and Erica gives me that, um, that work capacity and, um, and that mental capacity to be able to continue in this space. So Erica, thank you, I see you. Um, and that's my comments, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chair Baker. Uh, thank you, Randy. And yes, Erica, you're so quiet. I forget that you all here. I, God bless you, Erica, just thank you. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you, Randy, for your service. And thank you, City of Temecula, for rising to the occasion. We got the good stuff in us. We do. We do. I love this city. This is my city, you know. It's my type of town. And I'm here for it. I'm here for all of this. Let's, let's, let's grow together. Let's grow together. Let's live in peace together and thank you so much again city council for this great privilege and opportunity to serve thank you temecula and those of you that are tuning in around the world because we know you're watching stay tuned for the greatness that temecula is coming forth with good night good amen night. good night, good night.